ladies and gentlemen. Those visual snippets will allow us to gracefully segue into our third professional session of this conference. What is this session all about? Here for your viewing pleasure is the answer. Across the vast rolling waters of the Indo-Pacific, a storm brews, not of wind or waves, but of ambition. In these waters lie the treasures of tomorrow, critical minerals, untapped resources, and maritime riches that could reshape the destiny of nations. But these same treasures carry the weight of conflict, competition, and opportunity. The question is no longer if the race will happen, but how it will play out. In 2024, the global economy felt the shudder of a seismic shift. The critical minerals bubble burst. What was once a booming opportunity is now a frantic scramble as nations reframe their strategies. But where there is chaos, there is opportunity. And it is in these waters that new maritime opportunities emerge for those bold enough to seize them. Beneath the sea, the treasures we need for our technological future lie dormant, waiting for the next great discovery. For Sri Lanka, it's not just about survival, it's about rebirth, a blue economy rising from the currents of a shifting world order. But as the island nation treads these waters, it is surrounded by the watchful eyes of great and middle powers, each pulling at the strings of its maritime destiny. Can Sri Lanka navigate these forces, securing its future while avoiding the pitfalls of a power struggle that could pull it under? Its survival depends on its ability to stay afloat in these complex seas of geopolitical influence. And what of the lifeblood of global trade, the arteries that pump goods across the world? With 80% of trade flowing through these waters, the Indo-Pacific is a high-stakes battlefield for control. We face the growing threat of disruptions, whether by economic war, territorial conflict, or the unpredictable hand of climate change. Our challenge now, is to de-risk these maritime supply chains before they snap, leaving the world teetering on the edge of chaos. But the race is not fought by brute force alone. The future of resource exploration in the Indo-Pacific demands a new breed of warriors, algorithms and artificial intelligence, quantum minds that can navigate the geopolitical maze faster than any human could. Here, technology itself is the ultimate resource. More than ever before, the control of data, AI-driven solutions, and quantum computing are determining the resource battles of the future. Far from the world's eyes, in the remote corners of the South Pacific, the resource race has already begun. What was once the domain of small peaceful nations is now the stage for extra-regional powers looking to stake their claim. Papua New Guinea finds itself at the epicenter of a geopolitical game. Will it emerge a victor? Or will it be yet another casualty of resource-driven geopolitics? In this third professional session, we dive into the currents of opportunity and conflict, led by voices from across the Indo-Pacific. Are we on the brink of a maritime renaissance or a resource-fueled confrontation? The answer is ours to discover. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm certain that I echo your sentiments in expressing a distinct feeling of privilege that Vice Admiral G. Ashok Kumar, PVSM, AVSM, VSM, National Maritime Security Coordinator, has graciously consented to deliver a special address in which he would share his thoughts on the criticality of national and regional coordination in the maritime domain. Sir, May I request you to enrich us with your wisdom born of several decades of experience that you enjoy as a practitioner, analyst, and advisor extraordinary. The Admiral will be escorted on stage by Vice Admiral Pradeep Johan, DGNMF, and Admiral Karambir Singh, Chairman NMF. So you have the floor. Admiral Sunil Lamba, 
ex CNS and Chairman COAC, Admiral KB Singh, Chairman NMF, Admiral Swaminathan, Vice Chief of Naval Staff, Admiral Suraj Berry, CNC SFC, Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, Director General NMF, Flag Officers, Officers, Ladies and Gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. In fact, I don't know whether you all are aware, there was a global survey and that indicated that on the second day, immediately post lunch, any session, the, the audience are most attentive. So thank you, sir, for giving me this uh, uh, time. And so I'm sure the audience will be uh, extremely attentive in this session. Um, having said that, uh, I must confess that I'm delighted to be here to share a few thoughts on this very, very important theme of this year's IPRD, which is resource geopolitics and security in the Indo-Pacific. Before going any further, I must thank uh, the Indian Navy and the NMF, the steadfast uh, uh, knowledge partner of the Navy, uh, for having taken this uh, to a great level in the successive years of having conducted IPRD. Uh, I'm extremely fortunate to have been involved in almost each of the IPRDs earlier, and I'm extremely fortunate to be here too, sir. Thank you for the invitation. Now, uh, to start with, as the National Maritime Security Coordinator, I remain conscious that maritime security remains a vast subject. In fact, there are three points that I would like to tell you about maritime security itself. One is how we define it for ourselves and two other factors that impact hugely on uh, maritime security. First is the definition. The, in the Indian Navy, and in fact for India, maritime security has been defined as security from threats at and from the sea. I recall in 2008 when IONS, uh, uh, Indian Naval Initiative, uh, was launched in February 2008, the then Prime Minister had said that maritime security is freedom from threats emanating in, from, or through the sea. So this is one factor that I would like to tell you. The second is the vast scope of maritime security. Now, when you just consider the scope of maritime security, it extends from uh, a state-on-state -state conflict to uh, maritime terrorism to armed interventions where they are required, whether it is piracy or whether it is gun running, to just basic maritime law enforcement functions of uh, smuggling, poaching, IUU fishing, uh, and the likes, or drug trafficking, which is, which is uh, increasingly through the maritime route. Or you could have just benign threats of cyclones, uh, or tsunamis, or even pollution control, which the Coast Guard is the lead uh, service. So, uh, so this is vast. And uh, if you see any breach of maritime security impacts on every form of security on land whether it is national security, whether it is human security, energy security, environmental security, uh, economic security, and the likes. So that is why maritime security is so important. The second point that, uh, oh, sorry, third point I'd like to say is the inextricable linkage of maritime security with global economy. If 80% of global trade is through the seas, there is no way nations can prosper without ensuring maritime security. So speaking of um, global economy, as the global economy has continued to grow, the need and in fact our dependence on various resources uh, which, are, which are obtainable uh, from either from land or from sea has only gone up. So, and if you, if you look at the galloping technology and the need for resources to sustain this galloping technology, we find that the number of resources that are required has only widened. The list is widened and that creates its own complications. And because these are spread in various regions of the world, uh, it obviously plays into uh, geopolitics of the region. Now, uh, this resources have been obtained both from land and now as increasingly land resources are depleting at a rate which, we are, which is unaffordable. So, Nations are turning to the sea through very focused blue economy initiatives, and India is definitely one of them. And so this has taken the competition resources into the sea as well. 
Now let's see what are the complications that that throws up. Now, where are these resources available? It could be in waters which belongs to a certain nation, or it could be outside uh, the jurisdiction of those nations. And these have got its own complications. Let me list out a few. One is that international law, which is mainly the UNCLOS, provides for the basis of harnessing living and non-living resources for national development and economic prosperity. But the trouble is when there are nations which just do not care about the stipulations of these international uh, laws, especially UNCLOS, uh, when they challenge them or when they completely violate them, this has the potential to create interstate as well as regional destabilization, which we're seeing you know, uh, in, in various corners of the Indo-Pacific. Next is undelimited maritime boundaries. If you take the case of UNCLOS, I mean, there are these rules which are clearly defined for demarcating your territorial waters through the use of median lines. But same is not the case when it comes to exclusive economic zones and for extended continental shelves. So this can create a problem, especially when resources are found in these disputed waters. So this is one which we need to keep in mind all the time. The third point that I would like to make is technology for exploration or technology, in fact, for research, survey, and identifying where resources are available, and finally for extraction. So this technology obviously is limited. Uh, the availability of technology is limited with some of the countries and thereby complicating the issue. So what happens if a nation which does not have the technology to carry out these activities hires a nation which is more powerful, richer, and comes in, that data which is collated is invariably dual use, which creates security complications for any potential adversary of that nation. The other point that I would like to make is about areas beyond national jurisdiction. Now, as per the UNCLOS, it is the International Seabed Authority, which is responsible for allocating these areas for research, survey, and even extraction as and when uh, some metal finds uh, take place. But the trouble with this is also that the ISA requires adequate survey and research on the part of the countries, which not all of them, not all of them are capable of. Therefore, that creates uh, a geopolitical competition as well. When it comes to a simple thing like fisheries, now you're aware as to how the UNCLOS stipulates not only conservation measures, but across the world, various regions have established regional fisheries management organizations. But unfortunately, none of these RFMOs or the regional fisheries management organizations are consistent in their rules and nor are they kind of abided by, by various nations. So what happens is that these rules have been set for countries to follow them voluntarily. But unfortunately, if there are countries which don't care about these rules and do what they want to, when it comes to sustainable fishing, that creates uh, geopolitical issues as well. There are other uh, few factors that I would like to highlight. One is that the illegal activities in the maritime domain quite often triggers various other maritime security threats. For instance, the rise of piracy in Somalia is often attributed to illegal fishing in the waters of Somalia by you know, outside powers or nations. And so this can actually lead to various other uh, illegal maritime activities. Now, in enhanced maritime activities, especially for survey, research, and extraction of seabed minerals, can also create challenges of pollution and thereby environmental uh, impacts. Now, the other problem is about gray zone warfare. If you find that of late, there is increasing gray zone warfare activities that occur in the maritime domain. And this actually threatens, you know, national security. Now, whether it is, it could be just fishing boats, but if they happen to be maritime militia, or if there are survey and research vessels which are deployed, which are also mapping your undersea cables, these are threats, not just to one nation, but to the globe. And so these need to be, uh, we need to be careful of these as well. Now, one other major factor that I would like to highlight here is that there are nations with huge exclusive economic zones and continental shelves, which do not have the capacity to surveil uh, these waters, thereby inviting 
uh, non-traditional threats to maritime security. And what is the result of this? The result of this is that quite often there's a rush by countries which are capable to provide them capacity building and uh, capability development initiatives, which again can feed into geopolitics of the region. And the last point I want to make uh, on this one is that a closer look at a lot of economic initiatives and corporations and investments that a number of rich countries do have got invariably a hidden agenda in it. Whether it is what is now famously called the debt trap diplomacy or whether it is just enhancing influence with that nation and with the region uh, or it is with an eye on resources. These are all threats that every nation around the world faces. Now, so if you were to see the Indo-Pacific has emerged as a region for geopolitical competition and the impact of resource geopolitics on security is more intense in some of these areas of uh, Indo-Pacific. Now, although there is no silver bullet solution or, a, or you know, solution that can sort this problem out, especially because maritime domain is, uh, it belongs to the global commons. But let me attempt a few suggestions. One is peaceful settlement of maritime boundaries. This is extremely important because this remains fundamental to unhindered uh, utilization of your own waters for extraction of whatever resources there might be. Now, when I mean peaceful, let, you give, let me give you the example of India and Bangladesh. You know, it is a classic example of the problem that was there in, in dividing the waters between the two nations when the arbitration decided that this is how it will be divided, despite the fact that Bangladesh lost half of their claim and India lost, lost half of our claim. It was viewed as Bangladesh having gained half of India's claim and India having gained half of Bangladesh's claim. And both nations were happy and moved on. And this is extremely critical. We are, we, are, we are of the belief that unlawful use of the sea must not be impaired by use of overwhelming force and with total disregard to dispute resolution mechanisms. And this is extremely important. The second point that I would like to make is that when there are these rules or judgments which are passed, which are kind of completely dis disregarded by nations, there has to be a globally recognized approach to deal with this. I and mean, we can't be in a situation where we think that these waters do not impact us or matter to us, and therefore it has got nothing to do with me. You know, just because the sea happens to be global commons, any problem that happens anywhere is bound to have global impact. So therefore, I just reiterate the point that there needs to be a globally recognized approach to deal with judgments not being adhered to. The third point that I'd like to say is the lessons learned of UNCLOS. We need to address those gaps because UNCLOS has been here for many years. I know I'm ending the UNCLOS can be a challenge in itself. Just to give you a small example, if countries were to resort to basing the cha uh, changing their base points, and which is which is kind of logical. If you look at climate change and because the coastlines would, may tend to shift because of which the base points may shift, you will find that creates a complication with your maritime neighbor because now waters become contested. And this can, uh, this can not only create problems between two maritime neighbors, they can also be used by extra regional powers to drive a wedge between two maritime neighbors and between two friendly maritime neighbors. So this is something we need to keep in mind. The next point about this uh, unclose and the gaps that I want to mention about is extended, extended continental shelf claim. If you look at it, the unclose stipulations themselves have a potential to create problems when it comes to uh, seeking extended continental shelf. And the problem is also this, that the committee which has been set up to deal with extended continental shelf claims is very technical in nature. They do not have administrative or uh, judicial or legal powers. As a result, they don't get into your, uh, you know, uh, complications of, you know, counterclaims. What they do is that you mutually please sort it out and revert back to us. So I think this needs to be addressed because there will always be complications in this model. The High Seas Treaty, uh, which was uh, adopted last year, this has got the potential to limit unsustainable and violative practices, which have been you know, as you are aware, reportedly been adopted by deep sea fishing fleets are of rich nations sending their fishing fleets right across the oceans. Climate change is another threat because of all this, uh, the numbers of uh, numbers and the increasing frequency of cyclones is a threat to each 
nation of ours not only because the there are there are changing patterns of you know migration of fish which can cause problems with food security but also human security when the cyclone hits land uh, so these are things that we need to keep in mind finally you know dealing with all this maritime security cooperation is the key and uh, i would like to highlight some of the initiatives of india that we have done we our foreign policy embraces actually the concept of vishwa vishwamitra which is a friend of the world and the the vision of sagar as enunciated by the honorable prime minister uh, of india in 2015 uh, happens to be our maritime policy today really now based on that there are a number of initiatives uh, that have been taken in which india extends a helping hand by capacity building capability enhancements and by ease at patrols and coordinated uh, patrols with uh, friendly foreign nations the other thing is collaborative uh, frameworks uh, i have mentioned about ions that the indian navy set up in 2008 that has continued to be strengthened with year, with, the, with every passing year and if you look at every other uh, structure which is existing in in these waters of indo pacific most of them if not all are maritime in their orientation including uh, 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 there are maritime security verticals in iora in bimstec in colombo security conclave and the likes in fact the bimstec experts group meeting on maritime security which happens uh, annually is chaired by the national maritime security coordinator and the progress that has been made is phenomenal basic and the importance is felt by each of the bimstec country because the bay of bengal waters the entire subsea will be a part of the continent itself of some bimstec nation or the other so this is the collaborative approach that we, we need to adopt so all that remains for me to say is that the challenges to a rules based order emanating out of geopolitics driven by requirement of resources to sustain uh, economic development across the world uh, is a reality and the more we collaborate the better the solutions will be found uh, thank you all that remains for me to say is to wish uh, the conference uh, all the success and the participants uh, you know a lively discussion and we'll eagerly look forward to the uh, what the what the proceedings of this conference throws up for us to take forward all the suggestions which come out of this august audience thank you very much thank you sir that was a breathtaking address i'm quite reluctant to ask you to leave us quite so soon so we have you seated here for another book release the third of this conference this book entitled negotiating the western segment of the indo pacific maritime power play has been edited and compiled by vice admiral pradeep chauhan and ms anam khan who is an associate fellow at the national maritime foundation this publication examines maritime security within india's strategic geography namely the indo pacific from a doctrinal as well as institutional perspective as such it underscores the importance of collaboration and cooperation in pursuing our common goal of a stable peaceful and prosperous indo pacific may i now request admiral ashok kumar to kindly do the honors ms anam khan you requested to step on stage thank you Thank you sir may I now request admiral karambir singh to present a token of our gratitude and appreciation to admiral ashok kumar and may I also request the dignitaries to step ahead of the tables for a group photograph shortly afterwards
Thank you, sir. May I request the dignitaries on stage to resume their seats in the audience. It's time now to dive into the professional session proper and to enable us to do this. I would like to invite our exceptional lineup of speakers to come up on stage. Ms. Eva Pesova, Admiral Jayanta Pereira, Ambassador Peter Lau, Mr. Atul Tripathi and Mr. Mahadevan Shankar. To moderate this session, we are honored to have Vice Admiral K. Swaminathan, AVSM, VSM, Vice Chief of the Naval Staff, whose erudition and sagacity are too well known to bear any great elaboration by me. So without further ado, sir, I hand over the proceedings to you. Excellencies, Admiral Sunil Lamba, former CNS, Admiral Karim B. Singh, former CNS and Chairman NMF, Vice Admiral Ji Ashok Kumar, National Maritime Security Coordinator, Vice Admiral Suresh Berry, CNC SFC, Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, Director General NMF, esteemed panelists, distinguished veterans, guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you. The first professional session yesterday morning, you would recall, highlighted the complex interplay of resource geopolitics and security in the Indo-Pacific from the perspective of littoral states in or bordering the South China Sea, that Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, the Philippines, and South Korea represented as that. At the Chopal Bechacha yesterday afternoon, we had very distinguished diplomats from the EU, Indonesia, France, and Australia, enlightening us on their views on the region and its resource-based geopolitics. The professional session this morning provided us an insight into the dynamics of the region as seen by learned scholars from the United States, Japan, the UK, Germany, and France. It is now my honor and pleasant duty to welcome all of you to this third professional session as a moderator for the discussions this afternoon. The chairman of the NMF yesterday morning very evocatively described the situation in the world's oceans as being precarious. That, of course, applies to the Indo-Pacific region as well. Lack of legislation to counter non-traditional or quote-unquote gray zone threats and limit the exploration of sea-based resources climate change and its impact on littoral and island nations, biodiversity loss and depletion of entire ecosystems, interstate rivalry and divisionist behavior, and the weaponization of virtually everything from disruptive technologies to natural resources. All of this are the realities of this region. And we just heard a fascinating uh, address by, Ashok, by, by Admiral Ashok Kumar, who just told us about the complexities of pursuing maritime security in a region as contested as this, especially when there are so many contested maritime boundaries. So how do we see the situation that we face in the Indo-Pacific today, especially in the maritime domain? A single wrong call, miscommunication, misjudgment, or miscalculation could tip a delicate balance that sees cooperation, deciding alongside conflict, and collaboration coexisting with contestation and confrontation. All of these, of course, have profound impacts on the lives of societies and nations alike. Some key characteristics of the Indo-Pacific 
were discussed yesterday. Please allow me to provide you some more, especially those that are relevant to today's session. Being home to several key connectivity projects, the Indo-Pacific accommodates two large and mutually competitive initiatives of our times, both with very significant geopolitical underpinnings. The Belt and Road Initiative of China and the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for, a Pro Framework for Prosperity that was launched by the United States. Nine of the 10 busiest ports of the world are located in this region, catering to over 60% of the world's seaborne trade. The region is the world's most biodiverse area, being, being home to about one third of the world's shallow water fish. The Indo-Malay-Philippine archipelago is perhaps one of the world's top biodiversity hotspots. 40 or more sea-related disputes exist among countries of the Indo-Pacific, with several nations testing each other's threshold for conflict every day in very, very serious and tense situations. The largest number of terrorist incidents that are relatable to the sea have occurred in this region. The Bali bombings of 2002, the bombing of Super Ferry 14 in the Philippines in 2004, and the 2611 attack in Mumbai in 2008 are incidents that are fresh in our memories even today. IUU fishing in the Indo-Pacific is destroying ecosystems, affecting livelihoods, and depleting the environment very significantly. The maximum number of countries performing poorly as per the IEU fishing index are from the Indo-Pacific region. The region also leads in the great game of the 21st century, the pursuit of rare earth elements. It is rich in polymetallic sulfides, polymetallic nodules, and cobalt-rich crusts, and boasts of the largest number of contracts awarded to date by the International Seabed Authority for exploration of these elements. This professional session three shall perhaps delve into all of these aspects through very thought-provoking presentations by an extremely eminent panel that will, one, identify current market trends driving the global rush to explore the finite and volatile resources of our oceans. Two, examine the efficacy of existing frameworks like the UNCLOS, ISA, and other environmental and social guidelines in an increasingly contested maritime space. Three, identify mechanisms, both cooperative and collaborative, that seek to de-risk maritime supply chains and enable the transition to a green economy through decarbonization. And four, reflect on the benefits of transformative technologies such as AI, machine learning, generative intelligence, and big data to identify policy guidelines that can prevent irreparable damage to fragile ecosystems. In sum, this session adopts the theme, and this is my own coinage, management of conflict over resources in the Indo-Pacific through identification of policy frameworks, alternative supply chains, and new technological avenues for collaboration and capacity building. Apart from shedding light once again on the realities of resource, of resource geopolitics on littoral states of the Indo-Pacific, this session, I hope, will offer us two viewpoints of island states, one each from the Indian and Pacific Oceans, on your vision of a blue economy and your proposals to negotiate geopolitical circumstances through inclusive dialogue, capacity building, and environmental issues. The session, as you know, has five very eminent speakers, each with a stellar resume that I'm sure all of you may have seen in the conference booklet. Please allow me to provide you a very brief introduction of each of these eminent scholars. Mr. Mahadevan Shankar, core committee member of the current and strategic affairs forum, will commence the session with his comments on contemporary maritime impacts of the year 2024, critical minerals bubble burst, identifying new maritime opportunities. He will be followed by Admiral Jayanta Pereira, former commander of the Sri Lanka Navy, who will speak on the topic, geopolitical impact of great and middle powers on, upon Sri Lanka's transition to a blue economy. The third speaker, Dr. Ms. Eva Peshova, a Japan chair at the Center for Security, 
Diplomacy and Strategy of the Brussels School of Governance will then speak on the subject de-risking maritime supply chains within the Indo-Pacific. She will be followed by Mr. Atul Tripathi, a renowned consultant on big data and artificial intelligence, who shall delve upon resource exploration challenges in the Indo-Pacific geopolitical milieu, AI, generative intelligence, and quantum computing. And finally, we shall have Ambassador Peter Ilau, former CDF of the Papua New Guinea Defense Forces and former ambassador of PNG to end of the PNG to Indonesia, who will enlighten us on the theme extra regional resource driven geopolitics in the South Pacific. So, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of all of you, it is my pleasure and honor to once again welcome these distinguished speakers on the stage. And without much further ado, I invite the first speaker, Mr. Mahadevan Shankar, to please take the podium. First one. Okay. While the technology is being fixed, good afternoon to everybody. Namaste and a big jai hind to all the officers and students right up there. It's good to see everybody. Um, my focus will be to try and talk more from a business perspective. I'm not a Fauji by background. I'm an accidental think tank person who Admiral Johan presumes is intellectual. So I will try and share some intellect. Um, what I'm trying to do is I'm going to focus on about six of the critical minerals coming from Australia down under. We talk a lot about graphite. We talk a lot about hydrogen. Then you have nickel, cobalt, lithium. And all of these are underpinned by the ocean of copper, without which nothing moves. So I just want to try and give you all the big picture of what I want to do in the next 20 minutes. First, do a little diagnostic by assessing the current demand and supply gaps. Why this causes a bubble burst, hopefully we'll see over there. Then how do we address the bubble burst in terms of doing a survey and exploration and then developing technologies, what's required. Once all this is done, obviously the legal challenges that come through the ISA and UNCLOS. What are the collaborations that are happening in point four and hopefully point five is towards all the startups and innovation and building technology and infrastructure. So in terms of what I did a bit of analysis and from what I've been seeing, you have it up there. The biggest consumer of these critical minerals is your LDVs. Now, Obviously, China being the largest manufacturer, exporter, controller of all these technologies, that's caused all the issues that my previous speakers have spoken about and the global contestation. And obviously, you can see what's happened in the past five, six years over there. In fact, yesterday, that's one of the reasons why I asked that pointed question to Her Excellency Krishnamurti, the ambassador of Indonesia, and to the Australian ambassador. So these demand supply gaps have been gradually growing in the past five years but at the same time where i see it from it's more not a bubble burst it's a correction that's happening because of the supply and demand gap and come 2028 there's again going to be a bit of a supply deficit because of the investment shortfalls that are going on uh, this is again being caused because of where the exploration can be done in the maritime domain in terms of seabed. I'll come to a few slides later. Now, obviously, once we have done the demand supply diagnostics, next thing is to identify which are the areas where we can get the supply from to cater to the specific demand. And that's where up front I put the slides of those five bubbles and the copper. These predominantly are being found in the maritime zone and the seabed, especially the Central Indian Ocean seabed, where India has been given quite a few of the licenses. Uh, of course, there are other com countries that are now challenging and they also want their licenses to be approved and processed in there. China is pushing hard, so is Russia and Germany and South Korea. Then you have the Clarion Clipper zone where major contractors have already been given about 16 licenses, and that's I'm talking of 5,000, 6,000 meter depths where they're going and doing exploration. Now, obviously, Australia doesn't want to be left out, so Australia is partnering with India. Um, the CSIRO has tied up with the Indian agencies, and there's about $28 million of the top of my head of funding that's already been given. There's a lot more that's still coming in, in the pipework. Once all these uh, 
exploration results into some tangible outcomes, then we need to obviously do the environmental impact study because even at 4,000, 5,000 meters deep, there is an ecosystem which pretty much influences what happens to us living on land and what happens in the maritime domain, whether it's excessive fishing or even the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, for one, everyone talks it's getting damaged, even in Papua New Guinea, which my friend Peter Ila will be talking a bit over there. Uh, Nautilus minerals is something which I'd been involved in maybe 22 years ago, where somewhere at midnight, I got a call from someone in Toronto saying they are urgently needing an audit report to be signed because Nautilus minerals was being reverse listed in Canada and they wanted it by 4 a.m. in the morning. So at 2 a.m. in the morning, I was there with my manager and his twin sons, and we processed their whatever approvals need to be done, and they got into seabed mining, which initially was going well. Then there were environmental issues. Then it got shut down, political reasons. Apparently, now they're restarting something, but I won't take the thunder of what Commodore is going to say after me. Now, I thought I'll put this map up so that you'll get a bigger picture of where exactly the deep sea mining is happening. These are the potential supply zones. These are the maritime opportunities that we need to look at. And I think like uh, the moderator VCNS had mentioned that polymetallic nodules and sulfides, these are the high concentrates in terms of cobalt, nickel, graphite, etc. Of course, there's the cobalt rich ferromagnite crust, which are pumping up like small little uh, mountains in the ocean beds. Uh, I've seen the photos. I've not gone down there yet. Hopefully someday I'll get to go down there and see it. But the key factor is how does the ISA monitor and control these and how do they issue the licenses? And this is where the contestations are happening. I thought I'll put this up because India is obviously challenging itself. There's a lot of technologies being developed. I believe the 6,000 meter uh, gadget has already been deployed. And there is some more that's coming in the pipes, in the pipe work, pipeline. Uh, so this is what the Central Indian Ocean seabed uh, license area looks like. Okay, I'm not sure. I should have actually colored it. On the top right hand side, you may see something that looks like a bat. That is basically where the licenses have been issued to India in terms of the PMS and uh, PNS. Then obviously on the brown dots that are there, that's where there is further licenses being issued. Obviously, uh, I think Admiral Jayanta would possibly want to add something later when he presents about how Sri Lanka also wants to be part of this domain in terms of their exploration capabilities. This is what's happening in the clarion Clipperton zone. This is at 5,500 to 6,500 meter depth in the Pacific Ocean. As you can see, it's already getting a bit congested over there. A lot of the major countries are already got their equipment gadgets moving out there. In fact, I forget the name of this Hollywood movie where a Soviet submarine had gone down somewhere in that zone and the Americans used their technologies to produce a Bollywood movie production system out there and they wanted to go and find the submarine with the nukes anyway what they found is possibly much better they found all these wonderful pms and pns going over there uh, i'll be happy to share these slides i won't dive deeper into that in the interest of time i forgot to keep my timer but i'll keep going so this is one of the gadgets that nautilus minerals had been using and this was deployed at about 1.5 kilometers depth on the seabed of New Island province in Papua New Guinea. So they were achieving some success, but because of the threat to the nearby ecosystem, I think uh, global pressure also came in and the Papua New Guinea government had to pull the plug on it. But also what happened was certain mismanagement that happened and the Nautilus people, they had some Chinese intervention, the Omani Sheikh went broke, he went bankrupt and the whole project had to wrap itself up. But I believe there are some investors now looking again at Nautilus and they want to use these technologies they have created. I'll jump onto the point three in terms of the legal. I think some of my predecessor speakers have spoken a bit, uh, so I won't dive deep into what the ISA does and UNCLOSE does. What I wanted to challenge our wonderful speaker, Jeff, is why the Americans are not a signatory to ISA and UNCLOSE, but Obviously, the ISA is doing as much as they can in terms of licenses. Um, there are some license jurisdiction and dispute resolution mechanisms that are coming in place. 
it's going to be a big challenge in terms of how do all these uh, countries come to a common ground to achieve the same outcomes from whatever mechanisms they put in place. Obviously, the South China Sea, everyone has spoken about the contestation that's happening out there. Uh, Philippines had their resolution, but it was thrown away by China. So are we going to see the same thing in the Central Ocean Basin? Are we going to see the same in other basins where there is going to be, in fact, uh, our wonderful speaker from Indonesia, she's not here, Fifi, she showed about what's being found in the Indonesian waters over there. So will Indonesia also become another big place of contestation just because of the deep sea mining capabilities? Obviously, all of these are going to be impacted by what the insurance companies are going to insure out there. What is the environmental disaster that is potential? These environmental guidelines obviously increase the cost of manufacturing, the cost of production, the compliance, and so on and so forth. Then it becomes a question of whether it's actually viable to go down at 5,000, 6,000 meters. I believe it is viable because I think we have to find the critical minerals come whether it comes from the seabed, the ocean bed, from the land, ultimately, I possibly can say it goes into multiple domains of uh, utilization. Even the phones, laptops, whatever else we're using in terms of healthcare capabilities, healthcare systems, the hospitals, all of these are gonna be needing critical minerals. And if the supply chain is not sustained, it's gonna be an issue. So. Obviously, China is now having some issues in terms of their production capabilities, so they decided they'll scale up things in Indonesia. So Indonesia, from a raw material uh, exporter, started pushing a lot of policy changes. I think from 2019, they decided they'll become only an exporting agency, exporting country. Uh, that was sweet music to the Chinese, whether they were influential in that policy decision, we don't know. But the Chinese managed to produce large quantities and dump it into the global market. Once these large quantities came in, we saw the repercussions just this year, I think two or three large mines in the Australian, Western Australian uh, state have been shut down. There are serious questions being asked in terms of can deep sea mining become viable when Indonesia is dumping so much into the market. Now, obviously from Indonesia's perspective, they want to become a self-reliant nation, so they have their own aspirations that they are trying to endeavor. Question is, how does the mismatch happen? And if if Australia or others are producing at $100 a ton, and if Indonesia is able to get it at 60 in the market, obviously India will go and buy it at 60. But then at some stage, the equilibrium will come, and the demand and supply is going to become a correction by itself, which from the numbers and data I've seen is going to be 2028, 20, 2030, Hopefully, World War III won't start by then, and we will still have critical minerals in demand. From what I've seen, the demand supply, uh, demand equation is going to quadruple in the next 15 years. So by 2040, there's going to be a massive demand, but that's also going to cause a supply deficit. Hopefully, quad initiatives will go in that direction. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent it's going to be pushed, because I think Professor Hikoshi was saying the same thing also. Japan is looking at it from their perspective. India is looking at it from their perspective. Australia tends to be guided a lot with what the Americans are doing because of the uh, relations in the past. So they'll keep taking it forward. And again, goes back to the environmental, social, and governance. These wonderful creatures that are there at 5,000 meters, they need to be protected. They may possibly weigh two grams or five grams, but ultimately all of them are a collective just like every drop makes an ocean. Now, oh, a couple of slides missed, but anyway. Uh, I'll have to try to dive into what is required going forward. How do we build and scale up infrastructure for production, manufacturing, and distribution? Now, as you all saw in the earlier slides, the demand is predominantly, predominantly towards electric vehicles, then you have lithium batteries, et cetera, it goes on. Obviously, in the defense sector, they have their requirements also, whether it's 400 grams going into an F-35 or it's something going into a BrahMos or any other defense equipment. The question is, how do we build these capabilities 
add economic uh, points over there. And if these economic points of uh, cost are reached over there, how does it get deployed? Who takes ownership of that? Who gets the monopoly? Can India retain monopoly? Will Australia retain monopoly? And again, I must, uh, I told a couple of people yesterday, as the crow fly, the distance between Australia and India is just about 2,620 kilometers. That's because the sovereign territory between Andaman Nicobar and Cocoa Island is that much. So if that particular maritime domain is taken care of, then Australia and India together settle the entire Indian Ocean region with the massive uh, Western Australian state that has, I think, the longest border on Indian Ocean region. So many people tend to overlook the fact that Australia has so much at stake, but in terms of capabilities, it's limited. Physical resources, it's limited. Technology, obviously, Australia has some fantastic technologies. It's a matter of how much it can partner with India and scaling up, and some good partnerships are happening. I think yesterday we were talking some of it at the Maritime Working Group also. Now, obviously, the next point is about where is this technology going to be manufactured? India has got the Atman Nirbhar initiative going on very strong. Uh, that initiative is hopefully going to attract the finance from Japan, hopefully attract the technology from Australia, because that's what the J initiative is, J-A-I. Of course, J from J and also, but I would like to say it's Japan, Australia, India. And Australia has some fantastic technologies. I think Linus Corporation is one that does a lot of critical minerals and rare earth products manufacturing and exporting. They would be, from what I've been hearing, they would be keen to engage with India, but obviously intellectual property and all those issues are something that they need to get over. I think yesterday I heard one of the speakers talk about the massive demand for cobalt and that uh, India is looking at Latin America. I believe there's massive amount of cobalt also in Australia, but again, that's on the land. But if you go into the maritime domain, there's plenty on the deep sea ocean. So it's going to be a question of cost effectiveness. Do we do the land first? Do we do the deep sea marine first over there? I actually had a slide of the Samudra Mantan, but I think Chitali must have dumped that slide. Uh, but why I wanted that Samudra Mantan slide to be there, besides it being in the airport at Bangkok, it goes back to the Vishnu Puranas in India, which I think the students may want to possibly, if they're not slept off already, uh, they may want to read up on that of how the ancient science of India was, they wanted to extract the nectar from the deep oceans and they had someone going down there and extracting it. I think the deep sea mining that we are talking of in terms of getting the critical minerals is pretty much aligned with that same philosophy. And if I would try to use the Chinese analogy, India could draw another nine or 10 dash line saying that we have it in our Vishnu Purana, so that belongs to India. Okay, I got someone's attention. Okay, I'll stop at that. I would love to grab a few questions and answers and I'll pass it back to the moderator so that he can take it forward. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mahadev or Mahadev and Shankar. Very fascinating remarks on, on the presence of in the Indo-Pacific of rare earth elements uh, and the legal and economic complications and complexities in harnessing them and ensuring sustainable supply chains. Very, very fascinating. Thank you very much. Admiral Ongu. Thank you, Chair. Admiral Karam Bin Singh, Chairman, Maritime Foundation, Admiral Lamba, former CNS. Uh, my DS, uh, Admiral Bill Chohan, and uh, Ashok Kumar, my postmate, and our DA, Suraj Berry. Very happy to see you. Ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for inviting me. I've been coming here for, I think, so many, except in the COVID also, we, I could not join online so thank you very much and thank you very much for your kind hospitality every time this time also and i am happy to see a lot of students and ladies and gentlemen today i have been asked to talk on geopolitical impacts of great and middle powers upon sri lanka's transition to 
blue economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the need to widen efforts in unleashing the abundance of potentials over the oceanic territory has given new impulse to blue economic upturn, which is a gaining precedence as a primary branch of commerce globally. Moreover, the concept of blue economy, which the world has large is navigating itself towards um, implementing adequate economically and sustainable approaches of harnessing the riches of oceanic ecosystems and its surroundings for better gains. Therefore, strengthening the maritime domain in all aspects remain pivotal for nations to tap rightly such channels and create economic values for the vast oceans. Ladies and gentlemen, however, endeavor with uh, myriad uh, of riches and often known to be an island nation of attraction in the eyes of the international arena and the Indo-Pacific Ocean. Sri Lanka has also joined the fleet in embracing and uh, incorporating into present domain of development the coveted conceptualization of blue economy. Located along the crossroads of the vital sea lanes, the strategic presence of Sri Lanka has served purposeful for the nations to extensively rely upon its surrounding oceans environment in order to maximize the socio-economic benefits derived from the offshore regions. Ladies and gentlemen, the vast oceans surrounding Sri Lanka are limitless in terms of ability to help enhance the country's economic value chains and continued evolutions. Spanning over across sections of dimensions below ground, Sri Lanka's exclusive economic uh, zone entails a variety of natural uh, environment such as marine life, exploitable minerals and conventional hydrocarbons. The commercial opportunities such as factors offers are plenty. Furthermore, the surrounding oceans are now beginning to play a promising role in allowing Sri Lanka to witness the bountifuls of its marine ecosystem. Ladies and gentlemen, from sustaining coastal livelihood, which many coastal communities are heavily dependent on at present, Sri Lanka's offshore regions have also been able to support numerous climate change initiatives and adapt tourism-driven recreational approaches, which the nation is now initiating efforts to capitalize on. For deriving better gains, while the oceans generate an annual turnover between 3 trillion and 6 trillion globally based on the United Nations estimate. The contribution made by the surrounding ocean to Sri Lanka's value chain is sustainable, concentrated in areas of port and shipping, fisheries and tourism. Therefore, to derive deep or set sail towards attaining sustainable economic development may only remain the greatest possibility of all. If Sri Lanka is able to steer with the clarity and tap rightly the treasure trove of abundance which its blue economy harbors. Ladies and gentlemen, nevertheless, the phase of transition to a blue economy experienced by many nations globally may certainly introduce a paradigm shift in the geopolitical power play that is becoming visibly present in the changing international context of growth and development. Not only its implementing the individual transition agendas, but has also begun intervening in every special uh, level of offshore economic activities. Moreover, the increased tendency to draw collaborations by nations to various socio-economic spheres with an aim of promoting better integration of global markets and social platforms can be well observed along its transitional pathways. Sri Lanka's positional advantage is being located at the heart of Indian Ocean has further encouraged Sri Lanka's to mandatory embrace the blue economy transition. As an island nation now devising plan to harness the wealth of resources of surrounding oceans, Sri Lanka should initiate uh, balance strategies in a way that will uplift the domestic economy and allow all value chains to function in harmony. With that of all, advancement taking place in the global socio-economic arena, supporting the blue, blue economic transition. Therefore, not merely by focusing on country first policies, but by leveraging its users to better integrated domestic sectors with global growth units will help Sri Lanka tap rightly the riches of the blue economy.
Ladies and gentlemen, however, the process of reaping greater benefits from a blue economy is often conditioned by innumerable intricates which Sri Lanka, like any other nations, too, should tackle strategically as much as it can weigh for partnership, building and promoting further cooperation across boundaries, political unrest and rifts among nations, regional grouping that have stake in such movements emerge as a result. Moreover, the formation of trade blocks such as ASEAN, BIMSTEC, and the recently created Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RECAP, uh, continue to increase globally and grow. We need to adapt collaborative approaches of growth between nations to move tandem with varying global trends experienced in the areas of trade and commerce, sustainable development, and social inclusiveness is now gaining momentum also in the maritime activities spectrum, purely to facilitate the blue economy uprise. Ladies and gentlemen, Sri Lanka's ambitions target of achieving a net zero status by 2050 as a part of climate prosperity plan promulgated at the United Nations Climate Change Conference in 2022, COP27, is commitment towards protecting 30% of its land ocean, coastal areas, and inland waters by 2030. As agreed during the COP15 Conventions on Biological Diversity 22, and Sri Lanka's coastal and maritime sector adaptation priorities being monitored under four national determined uh, contributions, allowing the proper management of shorelines have not only widened Sri Lanka's scope for work associated with the surrounding oceans, but have made the blue economy's transition inevitably for the island nations. Ladies and gentlemen, securing peaceful maritime governance across national boundaries is regularly influenced by the, each country's necessity to uphold their national interest and their duty to conduct activities in a manner and safeguard their sovereignty, climate vulnerability, maritime insecurity caused by the rapid spread of conventional and unconventional forms of sea bond threats environmental crimes, maritime terrorism, and inadequate across to shared resources of oceans are several of the primary impediments, disrupting the process of efficiently managing the functionalities of blue economy. At present, there is enough evidence to understand the oceans have become epicenter for carrying out transnational organized crimes. These uh, transnational organized crimes at sea, also known as blue crimes, have a persuasive influence on a global maritime security landscape. Furthermore, several of the maritime and transitional aquatic boundaries are yet to be determined and the uncertainty arising from such undemarcated uh, borders may also result in the emergence of explosive tensions between neighboring countries. This type of unrest could certainly jeopardize the cordial relations maintained between nations and their willingness to jointly conduct development activities in offshore neighboring regions. Ladies and gentlemen, particularly in Indian Ocean region base, the global funding of geographic bronze to disaster is considered the world hazardous belt, and Sri Lanka is surrounding oceans regions to have had such encounters in the recent past. With the concurrence, uh, occurrence of incidents relating to the Engra Vessel Express Pearl in West Coast, empty New Diamond, facing the similar event in the East End, M.E. Merck Frankfurt, which reported to fire on board during this voyage carrying dangerous goods. During all this time, I have to mention, uh, we got the first assistance from the Indian Navy. They have reached to us, especially for the uh, M.E. Diamond, and it was shown in the, your video clip also. Uh, so disasters of this nature also make the maritime security landscape more vulnerable and volatile unless and otherwise sustainable disaster risk management procedure are put in place. Ladies and gentlemen, therefore, maintaining harmony and attaining a prospect to the cross border for Sri Lanka, especially as a member of the IORA and SARC, remains critical, ensuring that the surrounding oceans continue to remain a zone of peace and in keeping with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 14, Life Below Water, which encourages the con 
conservation and sustainable use of ocean, seas and marine resources for sustainable development. Sri Lanka should put forth a holistic ocean governance framework to help enhance regional cooperation rightly and collaboratively managing the surrounding ocean that will facilitate the creation of better integrated and innovative blue industries resulting in the introduction of the blue supply chains. Furthermore, the aspect of security being critical component addressed in the Sagar and Sagar Mala mandates also prioritize the need to protect the Indian Ocean region against traditional and non-traditional maritime threats to witness with which Sri Lanka has uh, comments aligning with national maritime agendas. Particularly the Indian Ocean region, which forms the grounds for managing one of the world's largest trade platforms, accounting for substantial flow of freight and port-led regional connectivity channels that traverse the oceans spanning from Indo-Pacific, Middle East, Europe to the United States of America is often exposed to various unauthorized activities such as blue crimes, which pose an acute threat to sustainable use of economic resources. Such unethical practices are generally adopted by various groups of individuals that are economically and socially marginalized and often results the weakly managed uh, physical structure and unresolved legislative vacuum of individual nations. While Sri Lanka too has become a center for, uh, for being constantly affected by these extreme risk factors, the blue economy transition, which the country of merging itself with has no necessitated the emergence of geopolitical and geoeconomic powers concentration, both positively and negatively, influencing Sri Lanka's expectation of blue economy. Ladies and gentlemen, at a time when nations are in the phase of transition, moving from brown economies to green economies, where they are much valued, blue economies transition forms part of such process, the contemporary world under can be seen changing. Consequently, nations may gradually try necess necessitating their powers, paving the way for launching new global and regional coalitions. Uh, novel challenge of uh, this nature may also introduce to a picture new hegemonies and count hegemonies as well as new political communities uh, comp composed by new actors, agents and dynamics. The shift and the interplay between these new parties will compel to redesign in the new political idol of understanding. Ladies and gentlemen, if the blue economy transition with aptly able to redefine Sri Lanka's economic stance globally will create or not space for geopolitical intervention of various magnitude is still questionable. Sri Lanka's objective to becoming a global trade and maritime hub that stem from its blue economy aspirations, the indigenous hydrocarbon resources which are the offshore Mana, Kaveri, and Lanka Basin of Sri Lanka and with and the potential of offshore region holds to generate renewable energy from sources such as wind, solar, and seawater are certainly contributing towards attracting interested parties willing to draw collaboration. <clears throat> Sri Lanka, with its growing importance in the Indo-Pacific consisting of Please change the slide, uh, not this, this take it last. Uh, uh, the previous one. And uh, with the growing importance in the Indo-Pacific consisting of global superpowers, large economies and major markets is being to build partnership in empowering the blue economy by closing, focusing on aspects as such as recognizing the value of blue capital and investment of natural uh, assets, maintaining inclusive growth, empowering the blue business and promoting jobs in the blue economic sectors to gain substantial from uh, the blue economy's multiplier effect, promoting energy from low or zero carbon sources, addressing resources scarcity and promoting the efficient allocation of resources, then building resilience to 
deal with the foreseeable impact of climate change, unlocking new human capital in Sri Lanka, blue economy, restructuring the maritime security architecture by conducting joint military activities, initiating efforts and aimed at conserving the ocean ecosystem and further cooperating with IORA to take forward the Blue Carbon Initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, the size and the scale of the Sri Lanka maritime area and such potential is forced to positioning the blue economy at heart of economic development for Sri Lanka. Would be a timed exercise, exercise the countries may gain well from, from especially during the present economic recovery phase, the countries grappling with the emerge st stable. It would be essential to align the domestic economic development strategies, regulatory policies and blue economic priorities and also collaborate greatly with regional international strategies with promote the same cause to help design and adapt ununified approaches that unlock the full potential of Sri Lanka's vast ocean resources. Most importantly, propose modes of uh, restructuring and regional maritime security architecture and strengthening uh, channels of building maritime diplomacy would be points of concerns in realizing all blue uh, economies to objective. However, if Sri Lanka can na navigate uh, this transition rightly, it may certainly become a uh, springboard to making Sri Lanka's uh, tailor blazer is sustainable economic development. So with that, I conclude. So before I conclude, I want to show this slide, sir. Uh, Sri Lanka, even though you said that we are family, but strategic, strategically we are very important. Uh, south of Sri Lanka, every day more than 300 to 400 ships are passing from the Saint Corridor. But uh, the international, uh, external, regional Navy presence in the Indian Ocean. But for information, uh, these are the these are these data are available in the web. So the last year, whole of last year, these are the ships came visited to Sri Lanka. So India eight uh, and China three. So more from India. But uh, previously, uh, Indian or Chinese Navy uh, survey ships entered Sri Lanka harbors, and there was issue. India was not happy, and we have diplomatically solved the issue till 31st December. So Sri Lanka is not permitting these people to these two ships, I mean, the service ships to come, unless they want to visit on a goodwill visit. So most of the ships, you know, going from west to east after doing their duties at the corridors and other activities for logistics, of they come. So 31st December, again, the moratorium will has to be reviewed. So, you know, as you know, Sri Lanka is going through, a, now actually just picking up, the new government, new president came, not the government, the elections are on, right on the corner. Uh, during the, the worst condition of our country, Indian government helped us with billions of dollars. So that is how, you know, we have recovered. Uh, and also during the tsunami, I must say, uh, defense advisor, then Berry was there, they are first to come and to help Sri Lanka. And now, about last two years, we have signed a lot of uh, agreements with India to develop our Mana Basin and Northern Sector and the Trincomalee. The connectivity, the road from, from Tuchiri to Trincomalee, the pipeline is a plan, oil pipeline. So then uh, the relationships are there. I hope, you know, we will continue and uh, we are always in India and Sri Lanka, we have uh, bonds and we have historical bonds. And thank you very much for inviting us. If there's any questions, I will answer. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral Janta Parera, for your very insightful remarks on Sri Lanka's position as an island nation in the 21st century global environment and her journey, a somewhat difficult journey to harnessing the blue economy through a peaceful maritime governance and cooperative model. Thank you very much. Uh, may I request the third speaker now, Dr. Eva Peshova, to please take the podium. Uh, she shall be speaking to us on de-risking maritime supply chains uh, within the Indo-Pacific. Dr. Eva Peshova. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon also for me. I have to say it's a great pleasure to be here. And with this, I would like to thank the National Maritime Foundation and Vice Admiral Chohan for kindly inviting me over 
and for making me think, for making me venture a little bit beyond by ascribing me this uh, this topic, which, as you understood, all of us had did, we couldn't really choose our topics, right? So we were given. So whoever was the brain behind this, thank you, because you really made me think a little bit beyond the traditional security geopolitical box that we are often locked in, um, and discover and dive deeper into this fascinating world of maritime supply chains and of uh, the shipping industry. Now, when we talk about um, getting out of comfort zone, I have to admit that after seeing the beautiful uh, trailers, the video trailers that we have all been seduced with, I thought I should up the game and turn this presentation or spice it up a little bit to make it a little bit more dynamic, uh, which has somehow turned against me because, um, as you will see, um, I have to apologize uh, to the AV team. It was not so easy because I'm using a Macintosh, so it got to in to all sorts of troubles, but yeah, I hope it won't, uh, you won't fall asleep through that. Um, anyway, so uh, I will have to go the next slide uh, instead of uh, clicking. So to make it easier, if I wave like this, just go to the next slide. Is that okay? Oh, I can, no, but it's not, uh, it's not the dynamic one. Okay, yeah, well, so we will have to go through the PDF one, I suppose. Yeah, just to explain, I'm really sorry for the intro, but there was actually a dynamic model that I spent a lot of time making. So there's a little ship moving throughout, right? But because. <laughs> okay, so this is the PDF version. So the ship is not moving, but I guess we will have to do with that. Oh, okay. All right, so great. Excellent. Beautiful. So when we think of de-risking, when you think of the word de-risking, as most of you know, it has been mostly used uh, in the recent context, kind of post-COVID and in the context of the US-China rivalry, uh, to refer to the need to, no, no, uh, the, the slide before. Okay, this is the price of innovation. Sorry, I'm, I'm really, so it usually refers, this is still the intro, it usually refers to the need to de-risk or reduce our dependency on China. So what I tried to do in this presentation is really to put myself in the shoes of the shipping industry. Um, and what we realize uh, from that perspective is that reducing dependency or de-risking or decoupling uh, from China is not only going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, but B, that it's really not the most important problem that the industry is facing. So what I tried to do by putting myself in the shoes of the shipping industry, and this is really going to be pretty much the structure of the presentation, is that we find ourselves in a pivotal moment uh, because the industry needs to face this grave um, big package of geopolitical issues, uh, on not only on the traditional realm, but of course on the non-traditional piracy, crime, environmental issues, climate change, technological transition, energy transition, you name it, all the while making profit. Next slide, please. So as we have all heard, and as we all know, maritime trade is important. 80% of trade by volume, 70% by value. What we have also heard this morning from Christian and others is these are figures that are about to grow. In fact, the maritime trade grows about 3% a year. Uh, we are all to blame, call it the Amazon effect, everything you buy on the internet, a lot of the things that you see in this room has at some point traveled those uh, maritime routes, and it is something that is here to stay. Um, the Lloyd's Marine Trends report um, say that by 2030, uh, we should hit uh, about 25 billion, uh, billion tons of goods being transported by sea, and of course the role of China becoming even greater. Now, that is a little bit ironic if the focus is on de-risking on China. And having looked at some of the maritime trade data, and frankly, it's fascinating, we realize that the term de-risking is mostly on paper. In reality, there's actually quite a little that has been done. And just to give you an idea, between 2017 and 2022, um, the U.S. imports from Vietnam, for instance, has increased 
from 4 to 8 percent, okay, from India from 3 to 5 percent, and from China, which was 40 percent, it barely decreased to 31 percent. As Gudrun was also mentioning, most of the big companies really understand de-risking in their China plus one, so they add another Southeast Asian usually partner to their China, but that doesn't mean they reduce significantly their presence uh, in China, and the Trans-Pacific route is really still the dominant uh, maritime route. And meanwhile, just as a, uh, another interesting data, well, of course, Chinese uh, trade contracts with South America in this very period have raised by 400%, four times, and with Africa, three times. I am not even going into the China-Russia relationships, there are you know, a, a lot of trade um, in coal, etc. but that's probably at least uh, of our problems. Uh, next slide, please. So, of course, the Indo-Pacific is central. Uh, not, it's not for nothing that we uh, call the 21st century nation century or the maritime century. It's all interlinked. Uh, I think I need to um, convince no one in this room. Uh, we saw the, the, the persons, 64% of all goods discharged and 42 uh, loaded in Asia. And in fact, the intra-regional intra -regional trade is 30% of the global trade, which is, uh, in fact, uh, a really interesting figure I found. Next, please. And it's across the supply chain. So when I say, um, you know, this is not just trade, but for the, for the, for, for the example of, of shipbuilding, 94% of global shipbuilding actually occurs between only three countries, China, South Korea, and Japan. And it has been alluded to, but China alone produces 55% of global ships. So the rest of less than 40% is divided between Japan and South Korea. Of course, there is, uh, you know, a division of roles. China does more heavy industry industrial ones, there's more highly technologically advanced ships being produced in South Korea and Japan. There are also emerging markets in Vietnam, Philippines, uh, including India. India is mostly doing the scrapping. That's going to be a big business because a lot of the shipping fleet, as we will see, is outdated. So there will be a lot of scrapping and a lot of economic opportunities for India. But let's also think about some creative ways of how we can cooperate in the shipbuilding industry. Next slide, please. Uh, obviously, uh, this is, again, not a secret, but it's always kind of in your face when you think about it. Four out of five largest ports are in China. In fact, six out of ten top points are in China. The only ones that stand out uh, here is Singapore, uh, but it's also Busan uh, and Los Angeles and Qatar. Uh, this is, uh, you know, obviously pointing all to the predominance of China. You can... Next, please. <laughs> which all kind of points out to the centrality of China. I mean, I think I was just, you know, emphasizing it enough, but so that you can see it. China is at the center of the global values chain. It is the manufacturing power. It is the greatest, one of the greatest consumer market, uh, markets. It has the largest bulker fleet, and there's a, you know, a long overlap. Um, China produced 85% of containers. Um, so I thought it was even more, but 85% is quite quite a lot. And perhaps most uh, importantly, China really has the leadership in all the new technologies that we are going to need um, in shaping the future of the supply chain. So we're talking artificial intelligence, we're talking smart chips, we're talking sustainable energy. So bottom line, we cannot live without China. But, next slide, we also know that it's very difficult to live with China. Uh, and we have talked about it yesterday, we all know what we're talking about, of course. Uh, China has emerged as a major challenger to the rules-based order uh, at sea in its neighborhood, uh, in the region, and globally, it is that systemic rival that we're talking about. But again, uh, if I put myself in the shoes of the, of the shipping industry, what really interests me is those shipping lines, right? So we saw they pass through the South China Sea, through the Taiwan Strait, through the East China Sea, which are under tensions. This is no secret. 30% of global trade of 5 billion US dollar a year passing through the South China Sea. Taiwan arguably has a, a large share of the largest ships by tonnage. But what happens, next one, uh, and next one, just go the full, yeah, 
So if I had the clicker, it would have been more animated. You can do the quick one more, please. One more. Okay. So just to give you an idea of how the shipping industry sees these issues and say, okay, you cannot pass by the Taiwan Strait. Well, then you just go around. I mean, of course, we agree that it's uh, much more complicated, but as I said, and it's also to provoke the discussion, this is how I would think. So if you just cut, and it's a, you know, just a hypothetical simulation, if you cut the passage through the, Taiwan, through the Singapore Strait, you go down the Sunda, uh, Sunda Strait package, and uh, you gain about 65 million US dollar a week. Because of course, um, if I'm shipping industry, time is money, and this is really in the, the only thing that I'm really interested in. Um, if you cut the entire South China Sea, and of course this is completely hypothetical, you would go down this, the, the Lombok Makassar Strait, then doubling again your costs per week. Next, please. But of course we know that uh, you know these points of tensions are not the only ones, and we have talked uh, quite a bit actually about with the, the Red uh, Sea. Jeff, thank you very much for making my life a little bit easier. So if we zoom uh, a little bit on some of the really bursting points uh, of tensions, and I'm quite grateful that as a European, we haven't mentioned that much Ukraine on the last two days, so it, it, it's kind of refreshing. Uh, what really is much, much more worrying uh, currently for the shipping industry is the Houthi rebels uh, in the Red Sea. And just to give you uh, some numbers, oh gosh. Uh, so 25% raise of shipping costs uh, in the Red Sea at the January 2024, uh, since January 2024. The shipping costs obviously relate to the cost of fuel. Um, this presentation has been done before Iran uh, dumped uh, bombs on, on Israel. Uh, so we can imagine this does not take into consideration any kind of major regional war. Um, in uh, in uh, the Middle East beyond what we already are witnessing in, in, in Gaza. Um, imagine that uh, a few of the big shipping companies like Maersk and, and Lloyd have already chosen to not go through the Suez Canal uh, and the Red Sea, but to go around Africa, so which adds about a week of travel. So you can imagine that the cost uh, that this impedes, um, which only very, very good, comp uh, very big companies can afford. So we are running into risk of bankruptcy of, of smaller companies in that sense. Um, insurance premiums tenfold, uh, just an example of the Strait of Hormuz uh, when uh, in beginning 2020, uh, when we had the floating bombs and the kidnapping of, of the Norwegian vessel and, and, and others. Um, the premium uh, insurance premiums rise tenfold in one week, right? Uh, and if that all impacts the costs of the goods and the costs of the of the shipping, rerouting, port access limitations, things, floating bones, um, shortage of crew. That's an interesting uh, thing that not many people necessarily think of. Uh, think of Russia. Uh, Ten percent of seafarers are actually Russian. Uh, and there has been uh, in records from the industry of, of you know, actually feeling the impact of, uh, of this. Um, of course, in times of conflict, uh, if commercial ships are and can be subject to, to, to malicious uh, attacks, be it AIS, uh, spoofing, GPS, uh, jamming, or some kind of communication interference. In the case of the war in Ukraine, we have also seen this use of shadow fleet. Uh, it sounds very piracy. You've probably seen it, right? It's these decommissioned, barely floating uh, tankers that Russia has been using uh, to detour uh, its sanctions and to transport its oil. Of course, there are a floating environmental disaster. A couple of them has already um, uh, set fire, been set in fire. Next, please. I don't know how I am time-wise, if I still have time, but um, I think in this region, I don't have to remind of the importance of piracy. Uh, beyond the kind of economic losses uh, that this phenomenon has been uh, entailing, I think it's important for the purpose of this event as well, uh, is to what extent uh, piracy has actually driven international cooperation. Uh, and it really is a good show is if there is will, there is mean. Um, because 
in 28, uh, when big wave of piracy started in the Arabian Sea, it was actually the first time, or one of the very few times, that the United Nations Security Council agreed in unanimity to deploy international forces in the Gulf of Aden. Um, so clearly there is uh, a way, and I think that the shipping industry and the costs, the, the proven economic costs or losses uh, related to piracy have been an important driver of this cooperation. Uh, next, please. Well, here goes, uh, you can pop all the bubbles, please. All of them. Yeah, so it's faster. One more. Okay, great. Now, again, from um, the point of view of the industry, when I look at the costs and, and the risks, um, there's even more important. Uh, so according um, to a UN report, uh, we expect, I mean, there's different scenarios, but we extreme, uh, expect the sea level rise by 2,100 uh, to reach between 80 centimeters and one meter. Uh, I don't have to you know, explain that all the ports are inevitably laying uh, by the sea and therefore are pretty much exposed uh, to, to, this, um, to this phenomenon. Uh, this, the port of Mumbai, for instance, is one of the most fragile and one of the most exposed. So investing in elevating uh, or adapting the port infrastructure to the sea level rise is a gigantic um, task with lots of costs. Uh, so we're talking with one meter, roughly 200 billion US dollars that need to be invested into just port elevation. Uh, already the typhoons and the giant storms that are, you know, uh, damaging uh, ports. Um, and uh, here, the reason why I put the typhoon up in Dalian was referring to the Lakima uh, typhoon in 2019, which has cost $65 million and three days. So the average cost currently is $3 billion. And again, we expect it to draw up to $25 billion US dollars. The storms are also causing ship losses 20 percent is quite substantial, uh, given the fact that that is something that is growing. And one that we don't perhaps uh, realize enough is droughts. Panama Canal and Suez Canal are losing up to 30 percent of their traffic or slowing down the traffic and causing traffic jams because of the droughts basically drying the corridors uh, and, and, you know, slowing down the traffic. Now, as a cynic, I could say, okay, great climate change. That means that the ice cap is melting and we could use the Arctic. I would have imagined that someone asked this question. Uh, of course, that's something that the shipping industry is considering uh, very actively. Uh, I can only add that obviously in the current geopolitical circumstances with Russia being basically the only uh, main actor of the Arctic route, uh, it's going to be uh, quite difficult. You can go to the next one. So, as I said, the uh, global shipping fleet is aging. Uh, it's actually very old uh, by all the standards and all the, the, the things that we need to go in. My ship disappeared, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so, 68% of the commercial fleet is actually uh, above 15 years old. Uh, and the average is 20 years old. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's getting very, very old and they're in very bad shape, uh, which means that it's polluting more. It's not up to the task and it certainly is not up to the fit for all the technological um, innovations that need to be today part uh, of the ship. So this is a report uh, by UNCTAD, but that also refers to the IMO greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction report, so all the rec all the things that the industry needs to do quickly, uh, and that's to decarbonize by 2050, which is virtually tomorrow. Uh, good luck to all of us. You can see uh, the costs uh, to digitalize. Uh, some of us, all of us, have been actually referring to the importance of technology. It's actually absolutely essential uh, for the uh, for the shipping industry. Uh, the use of AI blockchain and what we call maritime single window is, um, is, 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 is going to be the norm. It's already uh, the norm in ports as of 2024. 
um, the use of blockchain is facilitating, it's basically real-time data transmission. So it's going to make the ship passage uh, much more efficient. Uh, if, you, if something breaks on your ship, you know exactly what is the closest port you should go to that would have the facility that can repair your ship. If there is a weather, there are sensors on the ship that will tell you to deroute and how fast is to go to your port um, uh, that you need, etc. Of course, uh, uh, quite a challenge for especially developing countries because, surprise, surprise, uh, legally the costs of this transition should be bared by flag states. So we're talking Liberia, Marshall Islands or Panama. Now, of course, we suspect that the private industry is going to chip in, but, you know, this is the kind of situation we're facing. Next, please. Next. <laughs> I kind of lost track of how far... I am. I'll just, it's almost there. Um, and I lost my ship again. Yeah, Shadow Fleet. Now, there's a, it was actually a nice effect because it was the back of the ship and then the ship was kind of advancing and then it was going towards the... Damn it. Okay, uh, we really need to invest. Ah, but it should have stayed. Anyway, um, so... <laughs> No surprise, cooperation is the key to everything, um, and it really kind of sounds a bit redundant and obvious here, but um, I think it's really important to get the industry more on board. I'm not saying uh, to delegate things to industry, but I think that perhaps we're skewed in the kind of, you know, in our security bubble. Um, to If you use the PPSX, it should not move normally. <laughs> anyway. Um, not the PowerPoint, but the PPSX. Okay. Uh, so um, we often just consider, you know, still work in silos, right? So we keep repeating how maritime sector is, is multi-stakeholder and multifaceted and everything. But in reality, the policies are very much uh, still governmental. And it's, I, I don't see enough uh, of the inclusion of the industry, which really kind of has its own way. And I think it can be useful to bring some of the practical solutions below the state level. Uh, we talked about port-to-port -port cooperation. We talked about maritime safety, et cetera, et cetera. The civilian mal ma military um, cooperation in maritime domain awareness has been something that has been uh, alluded to, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But let's go to the next one. And here, I hope that the ship... You saw the width, actually, the... the... <laughs> There was a flag code on the containers, so, but, okay. Um, the many uh, connectivity initiatives, and yes, you will argue these are not just connectivity initiatives, you call it initiatives, regional initiatives, cooperative initiatives, you name it. Belt and Road, FOIP, Japanese FOIP, uh, the Indian IPO, um, the Blue Dot Network. Uh, global Gateway, this was a blue, uh, blue container, etc., have been proliferating and most often um, they really have been more tools of competition actually, uh, often put in place in reaction to the Chinese Belt and Road and to kind of you know, fix or, or aim at some of the most strategic countries and assets and to make sure that the other ones doesn't get there. Um, but of course, this is, you know, it should not be a place for competition, but cooperation. Uh, I'll leave it there because I think I'm already past time, but I did lose time at the beginning with the, with the intervention. Yeah, it's true. Uh, anyway, soft and hard, so not just uh, the infrastructure itself, uh, but also trade agreements. Right? I mean, it, it really needs to go both ways, and we should not forget about the countries that are maybe not as strategic, uh, but need to uh, need blue connectivity anyway. And I think we go to the last slide, and that's it. Um, yeah, I can probably just leave it there because uh, we know that uh, a comprehensive, a coherent, and inclusive, and efficient, and flexible policy is needed. But uh, I think that for the sake of time, we can just uh, leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peshova. Thank you very much. Criticality, ladies and gentlemen, of maritime supply chains uh, to sustain life in the Indo Pacific. Uh, how do we de risk them through making the right balance among security, sustainability, and profit in the face of enormous diverse challenges? And she said it right, it's all through cooperation. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Peshova. Our next speaker, I, I, I think she said something very interesting. She said, the dilemma of our times is we can't live. With China, we can't live without China. 
I thought that was quite interesting. Our next speaker, of course, is uh, Mr. Adul Tripathi, uh, who's going to speak to us on resource exploration challenges in the Indo-Pacific geopolitical milieu, AI, generative intelligence, and quantum computing. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Admiral Chauhan, for giving me this opportunity to talk about a very interesting topic. Uh, that is, how do we use Gen AI for AI and quantum computing in today's world, which is the most buzzwords we've come across in our lifetimes. You know? So, I mean, it's been a pretty interesting journey for me as a professional in this field for the last couple of days, decades rather. So, I mean, I remember this movie, I mean, like, I was sitting in the midst of mariners and who better than that most popular character now. So uh, this movie came all the way with the year I was born, 77. I can tell my age has come. <laughs> I mean, what I like about the movie is the fact that this is the, one of the first movies that talks about exploration of ocean. Yeah, this, this character talks about how he's going to build a life under the sea and he's going to exploit and explore all the resources that's my coordinates. Anybody wants to connect with me, I'll be more than happy. I hope it. Oops. Let's look at this thing. You know, what we are looking at is very specifically the India's strategic and initiatives that we have taken as a country. So we're looking at deep digging, and this started all the way back in 2022, and uh, the kind of effort that the government has been putting around it. What kind of things that has been happening? So. If we are able to do this thing, we'll be among the third, three top three countries to do it uh, as far as marine is concerned. You know? One second. So we'll be doing a seabed at about 6,000 meters, which is very interesting area. And we are about 6,000 kilometers away from the Indian shores. Uh, Third country after China and Korea will be able to develop this technology for mining poly polymetallic nodules. That is the important point. It's about you know, the manganese nodule modules you're looking at, which is main source for nickel, cobalt, manganese, iron, and you know that's the important thing. Now uh, coming back to this one, this is talk. This basically we're looking at where are we having a look at at the seabeds. Because uh, when we are trying to we'll be mining it out, the depth will be important, and I'm sure as very as you would be able to appreciate. Let me just cut through this thing. Now, that's an interesting point. Now, look at the crust zones, and when we look at where the mining zones are, if we look at out here, the top five countries. So right now, we have got two of them. And uh, we have applied for another two. So if we have another two from the mining bed, deep sea mining uh, thing, we'll be having the second most post China. That's the important thrust we're looking at. And because the majority of the companies, they're uh, they looking at the seabed exploration in terms of polymeric nodules, which is, uh, and this is primarily focused on clarion clepton fracture zones, followed by polymetallic sulfides, Southwest Indian Asian Ridge is the main thing. Central Asian Ridge, Indian Ridge, Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and that's the ridges we're looking at. Now, when we look out here, that's the polymetallic nodules, sulfides, and cobalt ridge. The important and interesting thing to look at is the kind of exploitation and exploration that is happening at various ridges that are there. That's why the previous slide, you know, when I talked about the ridges. And when we look at out here, we look at in terms of how these ridges will be there and where the companies are and who's doing what kind of an exploration. Now, if you look at it here, these are the 31 contracts that have been awarded, that have been given to the various companies and governments by ISA. Now, coming to the important point of my previous speakers about spoken, spoken about why is it so important? the renewables, the electric vehicles we're looking at. So where is it going to come from? Obviously, there's a dearth, or rather there's a competition is too severe uh, in terms of our resources that are there. 
However, we have to exploit and explore the natural resources. That will also bring us to the point of the use of technology, which we'll be talking about in coming. Let's get through this thing, you know. Important point to talk about is the approach that is important. So when we're going for this kind of a solution that we need to build in any kind of a technology-based solution, what we look at is the total uh, approach in terms of geo data, the sensing and information, the drilling test information, or samplings, uh, right from management to processing. So multiple data sets would be required which A, either we have it or we should start collecting in the days to come because that is going to be giving us an understanding of the, you know, the rock physical properties that are there, which will also give us a prop uh, recommendations for safer and resilient mining. The AI modules that are there, it is up and running, by the way, some of them are up and running for the mining industry on surface. So we are going to be developing something very unique across the world in terms of for the undersea thing that has not been done much, not much of a work has happened. So this is an area, it's a completely gray area. And uh, as a practitioner of this subject, I can tell you, we can, as a country, we can take a leap in this bounds in this area. So not many countries have an area, have developed these kind of models that are there, whether in terms of, you know, doing an analysis on surface vibrations, predicting blasts from various uh, sources, whether uh, it can also be due to fissures in the, uh, earth plates or volcanic plates, um, you know, AI enabled incorporating of the work safety places mechanisms. Um, another thing that I wanted to highlight was about this. How do we do it? You know, so AI based 3D modeling is what we're looking at. That is the approach. You know, you take, uh, this is the very uh, cutting edge stuff we're looking at and, uh, we're looking at the use of generative AI. Now that's become the buzzword in the, today's world. Uh, we're trying to estimate the volume distribution, the co cobalt rich manganese crusts, combine them with multimodal sensor data, collect them and using the autonomous underwater vehicles, uh, use machine learning as a classifier approach. So basically you look at data sets, you classify them, you break them up into smaller pieces and chunks and you map them on the 3D models. So as to you get multiple data types of, you know, the seafloor class or the sedimentation nodule and nodules. Another important point that is there in today's world is about quantum computing. So we talked about the quantum computing and this one, the buzzword. So where we're looking at quantum computing is in terms of complex ge uh, geospatial data analysis, where it has the ability to process your vast data sets because currently Every AI model is, use, is using a lot of data sets and a lot of processing power, which is, you know, a big in demand at this time period. So how can you cut through this traditional approach and can you can run through your quantum computing methodologies and approaches? You can use quantum machine learning because that will provide you a better and a faster way of doing your predictive analytics. Optimization of mining operations, whether in terms of supply chain, my previous speaker has also talk, no, spoken about this. Uh, efficient resource extraction, which is an important one. The environmental uh, impact minimization, which is a very important point. We've been talking about ESG, climate change, and all these things. The modeling, whether it is there in terms of environmental impact. impact. And here I would like to share my uh, experience is one of the big challenges that we come across in any computational models is the number of variables. So in any kind of a traditional uh, AI based model, one of the big challenges we are there is in terms, not in terms of data, but in terms of the controlling the in terms of the number of variables. It's here that uh, quantum computing as a methodology, and I'm working on a problem statement as far as natural disasters and natural hazards are concerned. Uh, the number of variables and the number of data points is too high to be considered for a computational purposes. It's here that the computer, uh, the quantum computing takes an edge and leaf out there and works out. Now, uh, another thing that is happening is the use of robots. So when we look at this thing, you know, how you can use your wide angle camera. So that, that's basically for your image capturing. So you're looking at image analysis. We start off all the way. Then your rotational, so robotic rotational factors, unstructured hands and your DOF arms that are there the batteries that will be required at a, high, at a huge amount of depth we're looking at. How will the data be sent back to the surface? Because there are another 
problem that we often come across is uh, sensing of the data and the transmission of the data that is going to be there. How do you handle that piece of the problem? So these are kind of technological advancements that the world is still working on. I would be very frank with you, not much has happened in this area. And this is where I said, you know, we have the advantage of the first movers advantage, which are a uh, huge amount of, uh, I would say, talent, both in terms of uh, student community, researchers, practitioners, and uh, the government. I'll skip through these things and just come down to this thing. Now, this is one of the latest technologies we're looking at, and that is in terms of understanding generative AI. So generative AI talks about use of uh, generating new in images or text from the current ones. So um, I did a project on a very interesting one, and this was talked about how do you convert your natural images when you get across, I, I stand outside the room, I will see a day, broad daylight. How do I convert that broad daylight image into a condition which has got extreme rains, extreme thunders? You know, that's a condition that is going to be there. So my most of the times I'll be getting a 98% times I'll be getting a natural light conditions. However, how do you convert that into a extreme weather conditions or extreme weather patterns we're looking at? That's an area that everybody is now trying to work upon. Um, the approach that is generally taking this, I would just like to take another couple of minutes. So I understand the paucity of time, respecting everybody's time out there. So we have a knowledge discovery or a knowledge value potential discovery approach that you take, where you'd apply all kind of your information theory, your functional analysis, and optimization problem statements. Then you do your data physical knowledge transfers where you're trying to convert your data into a 3D modeling stuff. So effectively, it's an image processing problem where you break up your images and you do, and what you do is effectively use a process what we call as neural networks, where just like we train our brains, we train the computing systems using data points and we provide the appropriate traits and we keep on training these models over and over and over again so that they're able to learn and relearn themselves. And then you feed on the data continuously because that's the very basic knowledge discovery pattern you're looking at. And when we look at the exploration activities and the kind of, you know, the stress points across the world, what we find is if you look at the green pattern, that is where the ecologically or biologically significant areas are and the biodiversity hotspots versus when you map it out with your ISA contracts, we can clearly see a pattern coming out. And, uh, some of my previous spoke, speakers have also spoken about China, which is the elephant of the room. Uh, now, having said that, uh, uh, when we look at the movement of the Chinese in the Pacific Island nations, uh, it's not only about influence, it's also about the contracts. Because a lot of these countries are holding a huge number of contracts, smaller countries now. Let's just go back to my previous slides. See that? Kiribati, Kuku, Cook Islands, Tonga, Nairo. They've all been in the news, not for anything else, but because of the fact that there's a lot of Chinese influence that has started to move. And the Chinese influence is not only in terms of strategic value, but also in terms of the contract values that you're looking at. And each of the countries, you see, Kiribati has got one, Cook Islands has got one, Nauru and Tonga, each of them have got a one, island, a one contract from ISA. That's where the Chinese are trying to move into figure. And when we use, we as a nation, we have the, as I said, we have the first mover advantage in terms of technology. And we should be able to leverage this appropriately so that in the best manner that we can use them for our nation's growth. That's all I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Amit Tripathi. You know, resource exploration, resource availability, resource distribution, and the challenges of exploring them, uh, how to overcome those challenges using new age technologies, AI based models, generative AI and quantum computing. Very, very fascinating and that's the way to go. Thank you very much. Uh, may I now uh, invite Ambassador Peter Lau uh, and he shall be speaking on extra regional resource during geopolitics in the Southern Pacific. Thank you, uh, Admiral. Um, chairman and your uh, officers, thank you very much. Uh, let me firstly um, uh, 
show my gratitude for um, the excellent hospitality, uh, bringing, bringing me in and uh, inviting me uh, to be part of this uh, uh, outstanding forum. It's not an easy job when you're the last speaker and uh, when you've been preceded by some pretty powerful brains. Uh, let, me, let me be more pragmatic and uh, talk about the place I know best. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, esteemed uh, colleagues, honored guests, uh, resource uh, geopolitics and security in the Indo-Pacific uh, resonates uh, profoundly, particularly for Papua New Guinea and our fellow um, South Pacific nations. The theme is not uh, merely an academic exercise. It's a uh, pressing reality that shapes our futures, our economies, and our security. Uh, in the context of our unique uh, geographical positioning and the pressing challenges we face, um, it is imp imperative that we refine our strategies to effectively uh, engage with the Indo-Pacific framework, Excuse me. especially through initiatives like SAGA and the uh, Indo-Pacific Oceans uh, Initiative. Today's focus, uh, I will look at uh, exploring uh, resource management and security in the Indo-Pacific with a particular emphasis on uh, Papua New Guinea uh, and South Pacific nations. Uh, let me make it clear, I am, uh, every view expressed here is my personal view. I don't represent the government or any other uh, group in, the, in, in that uh, sub-region. This involves leveraging a strategic geography for resource management and security, aligning with SAGA principles to foster regional cooperation uh, and sustainable economic uh, practices engaging uh, in the Indo-Pacific Oceans uh, initiative to enhance maritime safety and combat illegal fishing and promoting um, <clears throat> sustainable management of uh, marine resources through the development of policies for sustainable fishing and biodiversity uh, protection. First and foremost, we must uh, leverage our strategic uh, geography. The maritime and uh, continental landscapes of Papua New Guinea and uh, South Pacific are not just features on a map. They are pivotal assets for resource management and security. Our waters are rich in biodiversity and resources, from fisheries to minerals, uh, which are essential not only for our economies, but also for the livelihoods of our people. By promoting regional maritime uh, security initiatives, we can harness these uh, geographic uh, advantages to foster sustainable economic development that benefits our communities. To achieve our goals, we must align our national policies with the SAGA framework, that's my opinion, to foster regional cooperation, enhance uh, resource security, and promote sustainable economic practices. It is crucial that our growth is inclusive and equitable. Engaging in dialogue with regional partners will help identify common goals and enable collaborative efforts. Active participation in the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, IPOI, is essential. This involves enhancing maritime safety, combating illegal fishing, and ensuring sustainable resource management. Strengthening trade routes and regional connectivity will boost economic growth and market access. Sustainable management of uh, marine resources is critical. Addressing overfishing and climate change impacts as well. Policies must uh, promote sustainable fishing, protect biodiversity and ensure resource viability. Uh, recognizing traditional knowledge in resource management is also important. Respecting cultural heritage and uh, environmental sustainability. In the dynamic geopolitical landscape, awareness and advocacy are vital. Understanding resource competition and international law empowers us to navigate pressures and advocate effectively. A united front among South Pacific nations is needed to ensure our voices are heard and our rights are respected. The strategic location of Papua New Guinea also positions us as a critical player in the Indo-Pacific maritime domain. Our islands and coastal areas serve as vital transit points for international 
uh, shipping routes. By enhancing our maritime infrastructure and capabilities, we can ensure that these routes remain secure and open. Facilitating trade and economic growth is not just for ourselves, but for the entire region. The Indo-Pacific Indo uh, region faces uh, complex dynamics in resource geopolitics illustrated by uh, three case studies that I've chosen. Firstly, the much talked about South China Sea dispute is a critical uh, area rich in uh, natural resources and a vital shipping route. Territorial dis disputes, as we all are aware, involve China, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, and Brunei. Uh, with significant untapped oil and gas reserves heightened uh, tensions as well. Um, China's assertive claims and militarization of uh, artificial islands have promoted increased naval presence from the uh, United States and its allies to ensure freedom of uh, navigation. This situation highlights the need for regional uh, cooperation and dialogue as seen in the frameworks in uh, forums like the uh, ASEAN Regional. Secondly, in uh, PNG, the uh, development of liquid liquefied natural gas LNG projects, particularly the PNG LNG project operated by uh, ExxonMobil has transformed the economy. While attracting foreign investment and contributing to growth, it raises questions about equitable benefit distribution among local communities. The involvement of international players illustrates geopolitical competition for energy resources in the region, emphasizing the need to align resource extraction with sustainable development goals. <clears throat> Thirdly, uh, Pacific Island nations, such as Fiji, Tuvalu, Kiribati, and others are vulnerable to climate change impacts, including rising sea levels and extreme weather. They seek international support for climate uh, resilience, recognizing climate change as a security issue affecting resource availability. The competition for fresh water and arable land is inter intensifying necessitating regional uh, cooperation and advocacy through platforms like the uh, Pacific Islands Forum and the Blue Pacific Continent. Uh, this highlights the importance of integrating climate adaptation strategies with resource management. <clears throat> in short, these case studies demonstrate the complexities of resource competition in the Indo-Pacific and underscore the importance of regional cooperation and sustainable practices in managing natural resources. Collaboration among South Pacific nations is essential uh, for effective resource management. Um, <clears throat> by sharing best practices and technologies for the sustainable extraction and utilization of critical minerals and uh, rene renewable energy, we can enhance our regional resilience and ensure that our resources are managed wisely. We have, le we have much to learn from, uh, from each other. And by fostering a spirit of cooperation, we can develop innovative solutions to the challenges that we face. This collaboration can extend to joint research initiatives, capacity building programs, and the sharing of technological uh, advancements that can benefit all nations. Moreover, we, we must strengthen our maritime security frameworks. Um, <clears throat> Developing a comprehensive maritime security strategy will help us address threats such as illegal fishing, piracy, and environmental degradation. <clears throat> By collaborating with our regional partners, we can enhance our surveillance and enforcement capabilities, ensuring the safety and the security of our waters. This is not just about protecting our resources, it's about safeguarding our sovereignty and ensuring that our communities thrive. A second maritime envir environment, sorry, a secure maritime environment is essential for uh, attracting investment and fostering economic growth. May I suggest the Indian Navy is vital for maritime security and freedom of our navigation, of navigation in the Indo-Pacific, a key region for global trade and stability. It excels in addressing piracy, uh, safeguarding trade routes and um, enhancing regional cooperation through joint uh, exercises with the uh, nations like US, Japan, and Australia. I think the Navy can support tensions. Uh, sorry, let me read that again. The Navy can support smaller nations with uh, capacity building, 
act as a stabilizing force amid, amid uh, geopolitical tensions and contributes to a uh, rules-based maritime order. Additionally, it plays a uh, role in sustainable resource management, biodiversity protection, and humanitarian assistance, particularly in uh, response to climate change. Overall, the Indian, in Indian Navy can promote regional uh, security within the South Pacific, cooperation and stability, while, of course, advancing India's strategic interests. Investing in uh, capacity building and training in initiatives is another key component of our strategy, uh, what I'm suggesting. We must empower local authorities and communities to manage marine resources um, effectively and respond to security challenges. Establishing partnerships with Indo-Pacific nations, including India, will facilitate knowledge transfer and skill development, equipping us to face the challenges ahead. This investment will pay dividends for generations to come. Uh, PNG and other South Pacific nations are actively implementing a variety of initiatives to address the challenges of resource geopolitics and maritime security, emphasizing regional uh, cooperation and sustainable resource management. A key initiative is the establishment of regional security frameworks, such as the Pacific Islands uh, Forum's Maritime Security Strategy, which enhances uh, collaboration uh, among member states to combat illegal fishing, uh, piracy and trafficking through uh, joint patrols and information sharing agreements. <clears throat> Sustainable fisheries management is a priority for Papua New Guinea and other Pacific nations. Uh, they participate in Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, WCPFC, to manage tuna fisheries. PNG combats illegal and unreported uh, unregulated IUU fishing with uh, <clears throat> vessel monitoring systems and uh, stricter licensing for foreign fleets, ensuring sustainable practices and protecting marine biodiversity. Addressing climate change is crucial for Papua New Guinea and other Pacific Island nations supported by the Green Climate Fund. They focus on uh, coastal uh, resilience, fisheries protection, and water security, integrating community engagement and traditional knowledge. Uh, PNG also collaborates with Australia and New Zealand through the Pacific Maritime Security Program, PMSP, to enhance uh, maritime security capabilities with training in surveillance and resource management. I won't dwell on that, that's for a different time, but uh, it basically uh, covers uh, provision of uh, patrol boats uh, uh, by Australia to uh, Pacific Island countries, and um, it's uh, an efficient uh, program. The development of national maritime policy is also significant as PNG has established a national oceans policy that promotes uh, sustainable ocean resource management, integrated uh, coastal management and stakeholder engagement. Additionally, regional uh, collaboration is strengthened through the uh, Pacific Regional Data Repository uh, managed by the Pacific Community, SPC, which improves access to marine resource data for informed uh, decision making. PNG and other Pacific nations actively participate in international forums, such as the United Nations Oceans Conference, uh, to advocate for sustainable um, ocean management and climate action, sharing experiences and seeking support for the initiatives as well. <clears throat> These actions and initiatives reflect the commitment of PNG and South Pacific nations uh, to tackle resource geopolitics and maritime security challenges. By prioritizing sustainable development and regional cooperation and proactive engagement, these nations underscore the importance of collaborative efforts in the Indo-Pacific region. As we pursue development initiatives, we must ensure they are inclusive and equitable. Addressing the needs of uh, local communities and um, promoting fair access to resources will align our efforts with the principles of societal security and growth emphasized in the Saga framework. It is essential that we listen to the voices of our communities and ensure that their needs are prioritized in our development plans. This includes engaging with indigenous communities and respecting their rights and knowledge. Effective resource management and, and uh, maritime security in the Indo-Pacific hinges on uh, collaboration among diverse stakeholders, including the private sector, NGOs, and local communities. Some of these uh, key practices involve public 
involve uh, public-private partnerships, community empowerment, uh, inclusive policy development, where we engage various stakeholders in policy making. Capacity building initiatives by NGOs, leveraging uh, technology for better communication and co collaborative research that integrates local knowledge with scientific data are crucial. Joint advocacy campaigns also uh, play a significant role in uh, raising awareness and fostering sustainable practices. These collaborative efforts are vital for addressing resource management uh, challenges and ensuring the sustainability of uh, marine ecosystems in the Indo-Pacific. Active participation in regional dialogues is crucial for amplifying our voices by engaging in forums such as the Indo-Pacific Regional Dialogue, we can share insights, advocate for our regional interests, and build networks with other nations. This engagement will strengthen our position in broader discussions on resource uh, geopolitics and security. A definite sense of solidarity among nations in the Indo-Pacific. <clears throat> Addressing resource geopolitics and maritime security in the Indo-Pacific requires understanding key challenges like geopolitical tensions, overfishing, climate change impacts, illegal fishing, and economic dependency. Effective uh, solutions, fostering diplomatic dialogue and forcing sustainable fisheries, investing in climate resilience, uh, strengthening enforcement against illegal fishing, uh, inclusive decision making and promoting economic uh, uh, diversification. These strategies en enhance uh, collaboration and sustainability among stakeholders in the region. We must prioritize uh, climate change as a security concern. The vulnerability of our Pacific Island nations to climate impacts cannot be overstated. Uh, we must collaborate with regional and international partners to secure funding and technical assistance for climate resilience projects, uh, framing climate action as a critical component of our regional uh, security strategy. Climate change is not just an environmental issue, it is a security issue that threatens our way of life. By addressing it head on, we can pro protect our communities and ensure a sustainable future for generations to come. <clears throat> to effectively measure success in resource geopolitics and maritime uh, security in the Indo-Pacific region, it is essential to establish clear matrix and indicators across various uh, areas. Uh, key matrix including uh, tracking uh, reductions in piracy and, and um, IUU fishing incidents to assess improvements in maritime uh, security, as well as monitoring the number of joint patrols and uh, surveillance operations. For sustainable resource uh, management, regular assessments of uh, fish populations and compliance with uh, fishing quotas are, are crucial indicators of ecosystems, health, and effective practices. Community engagement can be uh, evaluated through participation rates in stakeholder consultations and community uh, satisfaction surveys, reflecting the involvement of local voices and in decision making as well. In terms of climate resilience, measuring the number of uh, initiated and completed projects, along with changes in vulnerability indicators like uh, food security and infrastructure resilience will demonstrate progress in adaptation efforts. To innovate and pragmatically assess economic diversification, we can track the percentage of GDP from sustainable industries and job creation in these sectors. We can measure international collaboration by counting uh, bilateral and multilateral uh, agreements and joint training programs with external partners. Ensure accountability and transparency by evaluating the implementation of uh, national ocean policies and uh, stakeholder compliance rates. Leveraging technology and collaborative uh, research, we utilize digital platforms for better communication and transparency among stakeholders. Um, in the interest of time, let me uh, jump ahead. Um, the road ahead involves bolstering regional alliances, pushing for sustainable marine uh, practices and engaging in key initiatives like SAGA. And Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative to sync national and regional objectives. Furthermore, there is a need to foster community awareness 
and engagement, empowering local populations with knowledge and tools for marine conservation. Collaborative efforts with NGOs, local governments, and international bodies can create a robust uh, framework for sustainable development and environmental stewardship. In summary, our collective efforts are vital for maintaining uh, regional stability in the Indo-Pacific, promoting economic growth through sustainable resource management, and ensuring our voices are heard in global advocacy. Um, by working together, we can secure peace, prosperity, and recognition in the international stage. Moreover, uniting our efforts um, strengthens our bargaining power, allowing us to influence international policies that directly impact our region. Collaborative actions also pave the way for innovative solutions, driving progress and fostering a sense of shared responsibility among nations. So, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude by embracing these in, uh, strategic initiative, initiatives, uh, Papua New Guinea and our South Pacific neighbors can firmly establish our presence within the Indo-Pacific framework. Together, we can bolster regional stability and security reaping substantial benefits from our active participation. Let us uh, unite to elevate our roles in the resource geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific, paving the way for a secure and prosperous future for this region. Now, ladies and gentlemen, is the time to seize these opportunities, advocate for our interests, and build a resilient and sustainable future for all our peoples. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ilao. Uh, I think how does how does a nation like the PNG negotiate the geopolitical circumstances that are imposed on it by extra regional powers, and 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 deal with all of that when sovereignty is central to everything that PNG does? I think that's that's it was a fascinating presentation, and uh, Ambassador, I was I was uh, particularly struck by a very evocative metaphor that you had in one of your opening slides, and you said it is much like a ship that sails through turbulent waters by negotiating the winds and tides. Very well said. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've had five eclectic, a team of five eclectic speakers uh, who've dealt with various uh, sub-themes of the broad theme that, that we coined for this, for this session, uh, which was management of conflict over resources uh, in the Indo-Pacific through identification of policy frameworks, alternative supply chains, and new technological avenues for collaboration and capacity building. So with that, uh, I think we've got about 20 or 25 minutes for question and answers. Maybe we could take five or six questions. Uh, what I propose to do is uh, we'll take uh, five or six questions uh, at one shot. Uh, I request uh, the questioner to please stand up, uh, introduce himself or herself, uh, very briefly state the question, and uh, also state whom it's addressed to. And I request my panelists to please note them down, and we'll answer them at one shot uh, after taking five or six questions together. So please, the house is open for questions. Yes, please, there, the gentleman there on the aisle. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Devaditya Agniotri. I am a consultant in the Policy Planning and Research Division at the Ministry of External Affairs. My question is to Dr. Pij uh, Petsova. Uh, I wanted to ask regarding, uh, as you said, that collaboration is key and uh, there needs to be a change in the shipbuilding industry towards making ships more advanced and more viable. If we look at the recent situation with the WTO's trade facilitation agreement as well, there is a slight worry that is coming in that there are some countries and some institutions which are reaching certain standards while some are slightly lacking behind as seen by the WTO FTA process as well. So what are your thoughts that as we move ahead, would such a situation arise in the shipbuilding industry and how detrimental it can be? Because some ships may perhaps have the capacity to look at GPS systems while the others may be lagging behind leading to a sort of collapse in data sharing between them, even on a basic level. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. The, the lady in the center. Hello, uh, good afternoon. I'm Ishika Kiran from University of Delhi. I'm a master's student in East Asian Studies, and thank you so much for the insightful session. My um, question is also for Dr. Eva. Um, I was actually really intrigued by when you mentioned that there are there's a policy aspect to this as well, and I particularly just you know sort of wanted to inquire 
how do we even bring about these policy reforms? Who is the primary actor here, so to speak? Because these flag states may not have the means to go ahead and enact these reforms on their own. So what would be your take on that? How, would, how do you envision these changes, essentially? Thank you so much. Wonderful question. Yes, sir, there, the, behind you. Good evening to the panelists. Uh, so I am Commander Abhik Chakravarti from Indian Coast Guard, undergoing Naval Higher Command course at Naval War College, Goa. My question is directed to the panel. Uh, sir, as Mr. Atul Tripathi showcased the pictorial depiction of the layout of rare earth uh, minerals, there uh, I could make out that it is on the edges of the tectonic plates, and uh, somehow it also overlaps with the biological uh, major biodiversity hot marine hotspots. So my question, therefore, is uh, what are the potential economic trade-offs between short-term gains from deep sea mining and the long-term cost of biodiversity losses and ecosystem degradation in this very important marine uh, biodiversity hotspot? Thank you. Thank you. Sir, we have a question here in the balcony, sir. Yes, please. There. Greetings to the distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, I'm Sushovan Chakravarti. I am a master's student of international relations from South Asian University. Uh, my question is to Mr. Mahadevan. Uh, in the last session, Dr. Walker talked about the divergent perspectives uh, of the business community, which is driven mostly by the, pro, uh, the, the profit motive, as opposed to the government, which is predominantly driven by the national security motive, right? In that respect, uh, given that Australia is a major lithium exporter, which exports around 80 to 85 percent of its lithium to uh, China, how do you see uh, the idea of uh, it diversifying its markets to other countries like India, something that you uh, espouse to support, uh, considering that the business community is still very much uh, wedded to the idea of exporting to the biggest buyer of China uh, and aligning it to the larger uh, strategic idea of Australia diversifying its uh, market. Yeah. Roger, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, my, I'm Cap K.K. Sharma, a naval veteran. My question is addressed to Mr. Tripathi again. So thanks for joining us from Tech Mahindra. And uh, considering your vast experience in data science, my question to you is definitely not res related to the resource exploration. What I would like to know of uh, AI-driven predictive analytics, which can enhance maritime threat detection, and what data sources would be essential for such systems, and possibly your recommendations for tackling the variables as you'd said thank you so we'll just uh, answer these questions and uh, when we have time we'll come back for the second set so um, ma'am maybe start with you sure thank you for the very good questions uh, both absolutely needed um the first one um i think this is really the greatest challenge that's why both these documents and actually we we always hear about this fair and just transition which is really all but fair and just uh, and at the end of the day, some countries will find the means. It's really about which country will be able to afford it. And we know that, for instance, China, with all the state subsidies that it has and that has, you know, keeps kind of feeding its economic progress, will certainly invest um, in in adjusting uh, to all the energy and, and technological requirements for its own shipping fleet and will probably become one of the leading um, also ship owning countries. So I think that these inequalities may grow even further because some of the um, kind of least developed flag states will eventually end up giving up licenses, which was an important <laughs> source of income. Uh, so we will eventually get into more inequalities. So when I was saying that the role of China may even grow, uh, that was one of the one of the reasons behind. So I think that there is really a need between uh, the countries that are emerging in this market to actually try to not neglect uh, this part of um, their policies and engage with their private sector, even subsidize, of course. Um, and that leads me to the second question. Uh, well, one of the biggest problems uh, of most governments, actually, and, and the maritime realm uh, altogether, is that it concerns so many different uh, sectors. 
Uh, it concerns the Ministry of Trade, it concerns the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, it really depends who you talk to. So the shipbuilding, uh, I mean, the shipping sector, it really cuts across the, the different uh, portfolios uh, at the national level. Um, some countries have a, a, some sort of a coordination, sub-ministerial level coordination mechanisms uh, on the National Security Council or the Prime Minister's Office, like Japan. Uh, which deals only for maritime issues, but a lot of the countries still need to grasp with this uh, with this idea. So um, it's it's really work in progress, uh, but we need to think about it in this sort of comprehensive is a very European way to uh, to call it, but really to take into account all these stakeholders. So perhaps having an agency or center of excellence that actually cuts across these um, these jurisdictions. How to do that is a challenge, uh, Amit. So, uh, I like the question around uh, this uh, you know, the AI based threat detection models that we were talking about. So, let's look at the data sources. Now, when we're trying to do mining and resourcing, you know, one of the first things that we have to understand is what are the environmental conditions? What is the pressure, air pressure, the water pressure we're looking at? Every given time period, what are the temperature changes? When we're looking at it in, in terms of uh, mining, it's going to be a long term. 20, 25, 30 years now. So we have to look at that uh, in terms of what is going to be the changes in terms of your environmental impact that is going to be coming around. As far as tackling variables is concerned, so let me just give you an example. To just predict a weather pattern at any given time period, at any given space of about 100 kilometer by 100 km square kilometer, you're looking at over 2,000 variables. Now, that becomes a big challenge in any AI-based modeling systems. That is why we have the quantum computing systems now playing around, a very important one, because then we, it becomes an optimization problem we're looking at. And therefore, the entire computational power has to be taken into consideration, as I was stressing on my during my discussion and presentation. Now, that is where the entire tackling of the variables is concerned. As far as the predictive nature of things is concerned, the here, a lot of study would be required because this is completely uncharted territories what is looking at. Not much work has been happened in this area, whether in terms of mapping of the undersea bed, whether in terms of understanding the ecology, climate change, uh, increase in the traffic, what is going to the geopolitical threats, all and multiple such factors has to be taken into consideration among the countries, among the nations, and the, most importantly, the company that is going to be doing the exploration. So based on all these factors, only then can an AI model come around. But technically speaking, if you would ask me what is it all about, it's about a problem of solving an image processing problem at a large scale and understanding the geo geo uh, geothermal and geospatial under undersea. That's the problem statement we'll be looking at. Uh, the uh, the edge on the the edges on the tectonic plates. So. Uh, Primarily, what we're looking at, uh, what we look when we look at the data points and we look at the uh, the edges on the tectonic plates, you know, and the mining contracts. Now, that's what I said. Why are they there? That has to be understood. And why is the uh, you know these kind of minerals that are present on that? Is it because of some kind of movement that is taking place from the crust of the earth? Quite possible. Is there going to be changes in the coming days because as the tectonic plates move? Maybe. We need to understand and make a deep dive study before we even come across. Because one of the big problems that the world still has not been able to formulate a problem statement itself is around seismology. We still aren't able to predict earthquakes. So that's a big, big challenge we're looking at. Perhaps in coming years, you will find studies being conducted and better AI models coming out. Thank you, Atul. Uh, Mr. Madhim. Uh, if I can just touch a little bit on what Atul also mentioned, um, in terms of the biodiversity, that's definitely going to be a critical issue in terms of how the deep sea mining and uh, extraction activities are going to happen. It goes to what the gentleman up there uh, on the upper deck asked in terms of, I'll break it to two parts. One is in terms of the business versus environmental social governance trade-off, and the other part is about China and Australia. Yes, there is a big trade-off that's happening in the ESG versus uh, the business aspects of it. Australian government is very well geared and 
moving in the direction of making sure everything is as environmentally sustainable. Having said that, they have a lot to catch up in terms of various uh, global commitments. There is a lot of compliance. In fact, last month I was at a particular meeting in Gold Coast where one of the businessmen said they got to go through about 73 layers of compliance before he can do his first export. That cost of compliance is so huge. It goes back to what I was talking about in my presentation where Indonesia, their levels of compliance based on their Chinese shareholders and uh, stakeholders is at a much lower threshold. So there is a cost benefit analysis that happens. Having said that, uh, I'll refer you to yesterday what the Australian High Commissioner said. Australia's foreign policy is driven by various parameters. China is the largest economic trading partner of Australia. There's no two doubts about it. In fact, uh, even the big changes in demand of iron or lithium that is influencing what's happening in the Australian domestic market also. So as far as the diversification aspect is concerned, uh, there were opportunities that happened in early 2020 when COVID hit and the then Australian Prime Minister started shouting the word Wuhan off the top of the roof, and that basically attracted a lot of Chinese sanctions also. And there was requirement and an urgency for diversification. Of course, India came to the party. There was a comprehensive strategic partnership signed between Australia and India on 4th of June 2020. A lot of trade has since started flowing both ways. The economic cooperation trade agreement has been signed. But Australia's flexibility and resilience is such they are able to fill their vacuum pretty fast in the rest of the world market. There is a big demand for their commodities. Having said that, lithium, uh, there were two or three large mines that have been shut down in the, last, in the last three to four months, I think, decisions were made. And BHP is one of the largest miners. For them to make that decision, obviously, they know what is the global investment in the next 20, 30 years. Otherwise, they wouldn't make that decision lightly. In fact, it goes back to, I think, last year, there was an announcement by the government of India also in Kashmir. It's going to be, I think, the third or fourth largest or maybe fifth largest lithium reserves in the world. So the question is, will India be importing from Australia or will they start exploitation of what has been found in Jammu and Kashmir? I'll just finish off by saying that uh, Kabul, which is the state-owned entity, I think yesterday one of the panelists mentioned that Kabul is going to Latin America and Africa. They have been working in Australia, but I think it's going at a very slow pace in terms of what is the exact balance, what they're trying to achieve in terms of what volumes they can import from Australia at the cost and the price. Whereas they compare that with what they can import from Latin America and Africa. So at some place, there's going to be a match to be made in terms of cost benefit analysis. I hope I've answered that question of yours. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We'll just take one or two more questions. That gentleman in the aisle with the jacket and that young lady there, just these two. I'm sorry, sir, that there are too many questions, but I think we need to really be running out of time. So uh, the gentleman and that young lady. Jain, everyone. Myself, Shab Dubey from Emerging Bharat, a young startup by students of Delhi University. My question is from Vice Admiral K. Swaminathan, sir, that what role does the Indian Navy see for itself in shaping a cooperative security framework in Indo-Pacific particularly in context of resource competition and China's assertiveness. Thank you. A young lady there, please. Greeting to all the dignitaries here. Myself, Pailin, and I'm a bachelor student at Lady Shiram College, pursuing Paul Science. So my question is specifically to the uh, Admiral Pereira, sir. Sir, how does Sri Lanka plan to address the concern regarding China's growing military presence in the Indian Ocean, particularly given the Hamban Tota deal? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sri Lanka, you know, I has explained uh, strategically very important. South of Sri Lanka, a lot of shipping density is there. And uh, Sri Lanka and India cooperation, I must tell you, we have historical bonds. So whoever who comes, we will never compromise. Whatever the government comes, we'll never compromise the national security of the India. That is guaranteed. Now, China fact is, you know, we are an underlying country. 
and china and sri lanka we do business right so sri lanka there's no effect and hamant report uh, you were telling actually during the uh, war we won the conflict from sri lanka uh, we had only one major port that is uh, colombo port and the next port was at trincomalee trincomalee little far away from the shipping lane so then government want to have alternative port then we have selected one place we are during tsunami time it was this was decided and we have bid to international and we have asked from the india and we have so many people and finally i think india initially that time was a little reluctant then in china jump into the situation and got and finally they have given money to sri lanka we built the government chain then the government sold it back to 19 dlds back to china so china hub is there so that's controlled by the management is done by the china chinese government the income also goes to them but national security security all the ship security are done by the sri lankan jurisdiction and even the customs other factors are there so that is there but at the moment it's not doing very well colombo is very important hub i don't know why i can't say why they it has selected dhambantota but at the moment even today uh, they are not doing very well i must say because the colombo hub is the focal point and we do a lot of transition cargo and also uh, we have adanis are coming and the euis will be increased to about next year more than 30 about 20 22 uh, uh, euis uh, millions of euc will do uh, next uh, next january after getting that so chinese presence as i explain uh, there are a lot of ships coming you know going uh, there are they they, are, they have strategically they have deployed their fleets you know now india coming to indian ocean and going try to sri lanka it's okay because they have to go from west to east east to west they have to cross sri lanka and go but chinese interest you know they come and they do a lot of research work and they do other activities and sometimes they come to sri lanka also for uh, for logistic supports but for if they are suspicious to india government has not allowed that is one example two survey ships came and india was not happy so government has stopped we have put some uh, regulations that again we have to leave uh, what do you call review uh, at 31st of december so that's all i can tell you everybody talk about china china you know but we need to take, take, take you know there are a lot of uh, you know investment in various road and belt everywhere so they are their personal interest in sri lanka also we have ambantur is also road and belt investment other activities so that's all i can tell you thank you i hope that i answered your question Uh, thank you, sir. So very briefly, I'll just answer your question. And before I close the session, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have uh, time for any more questions. Uh, uh, so, sir, the, the Indian Navy is very cognizant of the enormous challenges that face us uh, in the sea, at the sea, and from the sea. Uh, most of those problems cannot be solved by the Indian Navy alone. So the Indian Navy is quite cognizant of the fact that uh, it needs to work with other arms of the government of India and with other friendly foreign nations as well. we need to try and master as much capacity and capability that we can to address all this and i think forums like this uh, is very important for us to first come to a common understanding of what we face uh, and then you know try to find common ways of of addressing all of this uh, the 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 geopolitical situation that we face in the 21st century is very very complex it needs collaborative relationships it needs a lot of capability building which we are doing in the in the in the nation as a navy and as a nation So I think it's a very complex answer, but uh, please be uh, please rest assured, uh, the Indian Navy is very very cognizant, and whatever steps the Indian Navy ought to take, the Indian Navy is taking. Thank you very much, so ladies and gentlemen. Before I close the session, uh, may I request the ambassador uh, to to give us give us his concluding remarks, please. Uh, thank you, Admiral. Um, just a few words. I think. Um, well, firstly, thank you again for uh, having me here. I'm really delighted to be, and I'm glad I. observing the last uh, since yesterday uh, some of the brilliant minds that shared some ideas but uh, ladies and gentlemen um, the china phenomenon for the development developed nations like uh, papua new guinea and others in the south pacific it's a it's a double edged sword it's um, we have it for our internal context for development but there's an external context to it which is well beyond our control and this is where some of you bigger countries uh play a better role in handling the external context 
The question on uh, policy issues, I think uh, uh, it's not just here, everywhere in the world, every, every work, walk of life, uh, policy changes, policy reforms, is it's, uh, always complicated. Uh, but I think uh, understanding the different layers of interaction that needs to take place, uh, policies can be uh, resolved. Uh, when I say different layers, I mean, uh, you know, different trade, uh, different cultures, different countries have different cultures, different priorities, different values. I don't know, with technology nowadays, uh, if we're able to uh, bring all of this in and uh, maybe use the right kind of prompts uh, using AI, we can uh, bring some kind of understanding among communities. Um, but uh, let me let me end by saying that, look, um, Pacific Ocean is, uh, is a huge ocean. It's probably the biggest ocean in the world, and uh, <coughs> there's a lot of space, trust me. There's a lot of space. People say it's crowded. It's not crowded. There's a lot of space. And the reason why we're getting uh, people going in to, to do illegal things is because there's a lot of space. And the distances of us to fly from uh, one country to another is about one and a half hours, two hours. And if you fly from one end to the other, where all the um, 16 countries are located, you could easily cover five to six hours. So uh, it's, it's a big space. Um, so cooperation, I think, uh, to conclude, cooperation is a uh, priority. I think cooperation is important. Uh, the flavor of cooperation depends on, uh, again, goes back to the different layers of uh, how we operate. We have the, uh, the powers that play, the medium powers, and we have the uh, smaller powers, and then we have uh, developed countries. So how we interact with each other, uh, I think respect, uh, at the end of the day, respect and transparency is most important. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you very much, Ambassador. So, ladies and gentlemen, the Pacific region has tremendous potential, tremendous impact on anything that happens to humankind and to the world. Region. And that is simply why the Indo Pacific region orchestrates every year. It's very, very important for us to come together, uh, put our minds together, and try and find solutions to the intractable problems that we have. There is tremendous economic potential in this in this region. Uh, there's tremendous natural wealth, uh, but superimposed on all of this is uh, the big the, the big specter of climate change and all the adverse impact that it has on many of the littoral nations, the island nations, uh, and indeed the bigger nations as well. Um, uh, on top of all of this, there's 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 this huge ongoing contestation, uh, conflict, confrontation, uh, all kinds of problems. So uh, on the one hand, we have a nation that has so much of potential and, and such great impact on what happens to the world. And on the other, we have you know, relationships that are strained, there are tensions, there are stresses, and there is always the small possibility of miscalculation that might blow up on our faces. And how do we address this as, as, as an international community, as like-minded people who want to live in peace and harmony in the world? But the answer, of course, would, would, would have a toolkit and vocab vocabulary that would, that, would in, that would include things like mitigation, management, collaboration, cooperation, balance in our words, in our deeds, in our behavior, finding sustainable models, and of course, trying to form, respect, and adhere to a rules-based international order. And I think, you know, the, the recurring theme in the presentation that we heard today uh, from all these five eminent speakers was just that, that we need to find new collaborative, cooperative models. Uh, there are problems, problems need to be addressed, but we need to do it not through conflict, but through mitigation. I think it's been a fascinating afternoon, and all of you will, will agree with me that this eclectic team of speakers uh, have done great justice uh, to the session and given us a fascinating uh, insight into, into what, what we face and what we ought to do. May I just request all of you to please join me in giving them a huge round of applause. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Uh, I apologize for not having, uh, for not being able to accommodate all the questions. I think, uh, you know, we, we are up uh, at the next stage of a program and we need to reformat this auditorium. So thank you very much for being a, a patient audience and bearing with me. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, all our esteemed panelists, for that most illuminating session. May I now request Admiral Suline, Sunil Lamba to come up on stage and present tokens of our appreciation and gratitude to the participants of this wonderful session. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking all our distinguished speakers.
Mr. Mahadevan Shankar. Nujanta Pereira. Miss Eva Pesova. Mr. Atul Tripathi. And Ambassador Peter Lau. May I request all the dignitaries on stage to please step ahead of the tables for a group photograph? Thank you, everyone. May I request you all to please resume your seats in the audience. Thank you, sir. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, with that, we are now awaiting the arrival of our chief guest, Sri Rajnath Singh, Honorable Defense Minister of the Republic of India. Due to the same, we have strict security measures in force, which will require everyone to remain seated and not leave the auditorium. Moving on for the benefit for such dignitaries and guests who have only just joined us, allow me to welcome you all to the IPRD 2024. My name is Priyasha Dixit, and I am a research associate at the National Maritime Foundation. I am honored to be your host for this event. As many of you would be aware, the IPRD is an annually recurring international conference that reflects the international outreach of the Indian Navy at the strategic level. Indeed, your own presence amongst us is perhaps the clearest manifestation of this international outreach. This particular edition seeks to flesh out one of the seven pillars of the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, namely that of maritime resources. The five professional sessions of IPRD 2024 have been designed to examine and explore how regional geopolitics is being driven by powers operating within the often turbulent maritime space of the Indo-Pacific. The ongoing quest for sustainability and balance in our common yet differentiated quest for marine resources transcends mere economics and contains several intertwined strands of holistic maritime security. These deliberations will delve into the several standards of holistic maritime security that are themselves the result of complex geopolitical trends and policy decisions from the past and present and will explore how these might shape the likely future. While we wait, please enjoy a few snippets of Matters Maritime stitched together for your appreciation. 